getting nothing's being um nothing's being forced are we on is this us yeah we're going on we're going oh on nothing's, nothing's being enforced but uh several people are are doing it themselves you know just not not wanting to do the risk well you know you got to do it i mean i mean if you guys want if people want concerts back that's that's the price we gotta got to do got to pay you know for a little inconvenience a little inconvenience that's all it is you know mm -hmm. you know it's like you are obviously of the you know the peace and love vibe so it's like you know peace and love that to me that also incorporates uh being healthy you know you've got to be oh, yeah. as health, healthy as humanly possible i mean I unfortunately I got dealt with a bad hand, but you know we'll we could talk about that another time. It's mm -hmm. all about you ah. today. Well, you um, know we'll start from a good point of peace and love. I mean, this whole situation with getting vaccinated and putting on your mask is about compassion for the people around you. You know, so many of the anti-vaxxers are talking about um, living in fear. But it's not. It's so I can go out and live peacefully with you, yes. my friends that I care about. And I know I'm not giving you anything. It's as much from my point of view, too. I know I'm not getting you sick or the people you love sick. And that's the problem. Exactly. So most of us have people that have compromised health situations or elders around us that would, exactly. you know, this would hurt. And it's just it's not that big a deal to go get a little jab and then you know you're not going to go take this to someone and then they're going to get exactly. their parents sick and kill them because that's happening all over the place. I mean, thank yeah. goodness. I think a lot of these anti-vaxxers just haven't had it happen close to them, but I've had friends that got this. I've had friends that got really sick. I have friends of friends who have died. Um, I you know, I don't want this to happen. And plus, you know, like we were just saying here in Los Angeles, a lot of venues and a lot of musicians are kind of policing their own scene and shutting down their own shows that they fought to get scheduled. And I think I, that's I think that's fantastic know, because you is. know, you know, it shows the responsibility. It's like, hey, you know, rock and roll is about rebellion, but you know, it's also it's like when you really get down to it and you're human beings, you know, you want to make sure you as a band, you want to make sure your audience doesn't get sick and they can come back to more of your show. Mm -hmm. And vice versa, you, the audience should have on the same frame of mind. I don't want to get those guys sick because I want to see them again. Yeah. You know, it's like, know. you know, that's one thing. It's like, I understand everybody wants to get back to the time when we can go to concerts, when we can go into uh, clubs and, su and such, you know, where you can just have fun. And it's like, okay, that's, I mean, I, I, I get it. I mean, for me, I have, it's since ever since moving up, up to Maine, you know, I've um, even before I've really been a homebody. You know, it, it it took a lot to get me to, to go out. I mean, I, the last the last concert I went to was in 2000 for uh, King Crimson, and the last festival I went was in uh, 2012 for Ross Fest. So it takes a lot for me to get out because. Honestly, I, lo I like talking to people, but I don't like being in crowds. It right. Makes it, I don't know. It just makes me feel uncomfortable. It's like, you know, I want to feel allowed. comfortable. Yeah. And um, so, you know, and I, I was lucky. I got to see King Crimson twice uh, and both at the Wiltern Theater. Oh, yeah. 95. I was there. And... Uh, uh, 2000. Cool. Those were the two times, and I was really glad. And I went with my ex, and I was surprised that she wanted to go. But afterwards, she was like, oh, my ears, my ears. They were King fucking loud. my ears. Yeah, they were fucking loud. And I'm like going, yeah, they were. 
because um, we were supposed to be sit, sitting um, a little further back, but the usher said, I got I got a handicap because I was using a cane at the time. I got a handicap right up uh, stage left. Oh, man. And I'm like, going, okay, so I'm like, this is how I am looking right at the at King Crimson. And I'm like, going, and that's the one time I forgot earplugs. Oh. So well, my ears were ringing for about a week afterwards, but it, it was worth it, you know. Yeah, I'm getting that beautiful pain put on my ears on Friday. Yeah, you're going to see them. Yeah, we have Crimson, our good friends in uh, the California Guitar Trio, and then uh, we get the Zappa alumni band as well. So that's uh, pretty cool. It's amazing. I got, I got to, I got to admit something. Um, Okay, two bands, two bands that uh, you're into that I never got into, and uh, I see one, one I one I tried, and one I haven't tried yet, but I've heard some. I'm one I tried for. is Grateful Dead. That's the one I tried because I, I when I was working in the record shop, the manager would play everything under the sun. I mean everything. Anyway, from classical, jazz, hard rock, punk, uh, anything in between. I mean, this guy, I mean, you did not know from day to day what he was going to put into the CD player, you know, for the rotation. Never knew. I mean, one day that he would have um, Bad Brains and P-Funk in the, in the Like my house. In the, and it's like, whoa, I mean, he was basically, he, he was like my my teacher, mm. you know, in a ways, you know. But the other one, I haven't tried, but I've heard some snippets here and there, is Zappa. Oh, my God. Well, right That's here, the, everybody, right? everybody listening, <laughs> go get... Go get the Zappa Buffalo 80 set. It's a live show from 1980. I can't, it's such a it's a it's a crime that this wasn't an official release when Zappa was out. Uh, right. But thanks to Joe Travers and the Zappa family trust and the whole thing and their record, they posthumously released it. And didn't they also release something? Um, well, they from they're 19, doing a 1988. Whole Yep. Like yep. from 1988? Yeah, because... Screw that. Uh, I'm sure that's great. But get, <laughs> if, if you want an entry to Zappa, get this 1980 set. It's got an am amazing tune selection, but the performances are unparalleled. It's got 21-year-old Vinny Caliuta bringing A game on the drums. You've never heard drums this good. It's, it's, my, it's my favorite Vinny recording. Uh, a young Steve Vai... Steve Vai and right. Caliuta in the same band. Uh, it's incredible. I had, a fr I had a friend of mine that he was into Zappa, and he, but the one that he was playing a lot was Jazz from Hell. That's interesting. I mean, he was playing know. that, and I was like, I was like, I didn't, but this was like back in like, I'm going to say 85, 86, somewhere in that area. Yeah. When I was when I was working at a video store and after hours he would put music on and he where it was like ninety-five percent of the time, jazz from hell would go in. Or yeah, and the other times sell. the it's other great, time but it's a tough sell. I mean you're a band guy. You want songs, you want rock, you want music. I would get uh um Oh my god. I've okay, got so I've gotten those. The the Zappa band was super, super hot in 74. There's the Live at the Roxy set, which is the second thing I would get. And one size fits all. Thank you very much. There's a there's a CD called One Size Fits All. And that's a studio recording uh with some live stuff mixed in. And then uh the but I would say that 80, Buffalo 80, hottest plane you're ever gonna hear. And then also just really fun stuff is the stuff from 74. That's my personal favorite stuff. But, you know, a lot of people like the mother's stuff that's more vocal and, um, um, you know, sort of uh, surreal and nonsensical and uh, abstract, you know, more vocal heavy stuff with like Flo and Eddie, 
you know, I mean, that's, you know, Zappa and the Grateful Dead. I mean, you know, they're, they're just like, you know, you get the same kind of problems as you get with any career artist, you know. Right. I mean, you look at you, you've got those beautiful Genesis box sets behind yeah. you. Uh, you know, it's like if someone says, hey, Ron, you should really check out Genesis and you go pull out um i can't dance what's this this is crap you know why would anybody like this you know so right. it's just like you know you got to go and go oh, peter gabriel used to be in this band you know it's the same oh stuff. yeah you, know, you gotta you gotta you just gotta poke around one of the other things i got about a year or so ago is the that Buford box oh what's in that uh it's got his studio albums and some unreleased stuff and some live stuff and ooh. Pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty good. I mean, it was a first. I mean, I knew of him from with the yes, acid and then King Crimson and then UK, you know, I knew of that. Uh, but I never really delved into his solo stuff until I saw a really good, a really good deal on that. I think I, I think I got that for $50 and normally it's like double that. And probably now it's triple, you know, I think, you know, that's the one thing I hate about these beautiful box sets they come out they go out of print and then you see outlandish prices on ebay or even even discogs you know the people are trying to, to capitalize on on the name and the fact that it's no longer in print oh, and it's no. like you know it's like you know i'm sorry those are greedy motherfuckers you know, I'm going to stay right there. Hey, how about tickets? Jesus Christ. You, you know, it's like, oh I, I had one CD that, you know, I needed to, um, I needed money at the time. And this was back in 2005, 2006. I needed some money. And I really hated getting rid of it, but I got the thing back again. But I put it, uh, the first Angle Guard CD, you know, oh. and, and I put it up because a friend of mine told me, good trick. He says, put it at 99 cents, figure out the, the shipping on uh, doing the auction thing. Well, I did that. That sold for 90 bucks. That thing sold for 90 fucking dollars. And I'm like going, are you serious, man? You know, okay. I don't feel bad because I started at 99 cents. You guys drove up the price. And I think that's what people are basing things on is how certain items drive up the price. And it's yeah. like, you just you talked know, me into selling my copy of that. Just kidding. <laughs> you know, you, there's some stuff that, you know, I, I regretted selling because you see how I have two of these. Yeah. At one time there was a third one. Oh, I bet. Uh, going back to uh, 2008, but you know, it's like some of the stuff, you know, like if there's a CD from a band uh, and then it gets reissued and I listen to what other people say and if they, if a consensus said it, the reissue sounds better, I go sell the CD I got and I get the reissue. I'm not the kind of person that has the the money to have 20 copies of whatever, you know, right. I can, I, I need to have, for me, I want to keep the best, but I am so behind on all the Stephen Wilson things, like when he did King Crimson and yes, you know, I mean, I never, I didn't even know, no, he did. Yes. I got guess, two. guess what? The music hasn't changed. It's still great. And, don't and I got, you don't need to get any of those. And I got, you know, I got the couple, because I never owned a couple of albums. Uh, got a couple what albums? Ecstasy. Oh, XTC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I got a couple of those. It, you know, those were um, his mix, but it was like they were 20 bucks. I mean, I can handle that. Yeah. Once they started going in, you know, up into the 40s and 50s and 60s, and it's like, you know, how... How many, you know, like, I mean, Crimson is is guilty of this, you know, when they did like their album, their 70s, you know, actually they're, all their albums they, so far they're up into the 70s, they've done these massive box sets where there's 20 something <laughs> discs. I'm like, going, you know, I understand the bands, you guys need to make money because, you know, you weren't, you weren't a top 40. I understand that. But, you know, stop. 
fans. Yeah, it's a burn. I mean, it's like give the fans your definitive version of the album and keep it at that. Mm-hmm. Next thing is it did you film it? Okay, if you filmed it, put that out on you know now Blu-ray. Put that out on Blu. Now people can see, okay, we've heard it the live CD. Now, you know, let's see the live video. And I think, you know, there's so many of those. Uh, I, I personally, I prefer a live video over a live CD because mm-hmm. I want to, I want to visualize how the band is doing things. You know, I don't want to kind of guess. Right. But, you know, I understand, you know, they need to make money. They're not, yeah. they're not a hit maker hit maker they never wanted to be a hit maker any of these bands you know that we love right so they got to make some sort of money but at the same time they got to respect their fans that not all the fans have uh disposable cash yeah lay down every single time something well you a know new, a new version of it you shouldn't you, it's hard not to i'm in the same boat i don't know oh, yeah it i mean you see all but these those wonderful... are not for us you know that's the way that i they're not for us and the problem is there are a lot of people that have a lot of money and that's who it's for and right. and they can buy it and they can show the band some love and they can get some money oh yeah you know I, I i think it's wonderful online somehow i but, mean i got from the jet hotel ones i got Stormwalk and A. I got those because I never had them on CD. I had them on cassette, you know, back when the dinosaurs roamed the earth, but I never had, actually, I never owned A. I had Stormwatch on cassette and mm-hmm. Aqualung. You know, those were the only ones I had on cassette. So when it came out on, you know, on CD, and I, I don't know, I just wasn't on that, you know, the, that plane to to get them so but when they came out on, the, on these deluxe books i was like going, okay that's a that's a handsome package mm-hmm. you know you I'm know sure you hard, a lot a hardcover and there's you know a little book in there so you could kind of learn you know about what went into doing the album you know that's, that's something i'm really interested in, yeah because i love the behind the scenes of album making you know i i I have to thank my friend's band that I was so lucky to be in a room no no bigger than my little office here where you got three guys, you know, guitar, bass, drums, and they were just like, you know, rehearsing everything. And then it was start rehearsing a new song. And then they asked me, what do I think? I'm like, mm-hmm. no one's ever asked me that, you know? And so it was, it was so cool to be on Who's the that? ground. Um, they were a band in LA called Heavy the World. Uh, oh. It was a three piece. The bass player every once in a while came out with a, a double neck. Um, Bucker didn't know how to play. I mean, he could do the, the all the, the rock star stances and everything like that. But, you know. That's the important thing at the end of the day. I mean, they, uh, well, the guitar player would go into a nice solo and they didn't rehearse it. And all of a sudden, the bass player goes into a solo, and it's like the drummer's like going, he's like going, "What the fuck? You know what's going on here?" Mm. Unfortunately, the guitar player and the bass player, well, fortunately for them, they came from a progressive rock uh, background. Uh, the drummer was more from a heavy metal thrash metal background, Whoa. so he didn't get. Things. I mean, I mean, I remember one time they did a uh, fantastic version of the knife by Ooh. Genesis, yeah, yeah, and yeah. it was pure oh. heavy metal sound. And the guitar player blew it by telling the drummer that he goes, "No, nope, not playing that ever again." And I was like, I took the guitar player and said, "Dude, lie to lie to him. Tell him next time that you're going to do one of these songs. Tell him you wrote." You know, and leave it at that. You know, lie to them. You know, because that sounded awesome. I mean, it, it honestly took that song to the next level. Hmm. You know, a three-piece, no keyboards. You wow. know, so you know, 
they didn't really last that long because they, you know, they were going, going in so many different directions. I mean, they played a couple places on the strip, you know, like uh, Christmas the Roxy. And, uh, no, no. Yeah, the Roxy and the Whiskey, which mm -hmm. I got to be honest, I saw, you know, in concerts, you know, and, and mentionings on magazines and stuff like that how legendary this place was. When I went in there, I was like going, I'm not going to get killed for this. It's a fucking dump. That place is a dump. I don't know how this place got so legend. I think it was more well, because of the bands that played there, not sure. so much the, the building itself. So, like, right. But, you know, it was kind of cool. Got a chance to... Um, Your, your friend Chet, don't tell that to Kate Bush. She won't release the Blu-ray before on. Yeah. That, oh. oh yeah, let's dive in. A lot of people. I would love it. I would love to see some live footage of those uh, last shows she did. Those British shows. Oh yeah, that what was that? Six nights, seven nights, or something like that. She did. Yeah. At the Hammersmith. Yeah. And, my goodness. I you know. So what's this? I, I Where seen... are you getting comments? Oh, oh um, there they are. Oh, there I see. they are. Yeah. Okay. Let me turn the yeah. off here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um. So I I heard the two songs you sent me for the Astral Arc. And the Astral Arc. We're coming at you. I mean, that sounds pretty damn good. You know. Thanks. It's. Um. I was so like. So what's uh. And I know you said you're you're in the what is it in the place and time where you're going to be getting new backups in backup your band, you know. Uh, you know we're we're in a we're we're uh, we're just we're just uh, in we flux. started getting <laughs> we started getting out there and. Um, uh, Things are so crazy post COVID that um, here in Los Angeles, all the established bands just snagged up every available good slot at every good club for months. Nice. So, you know, we, we missed, you know, we were a little late getting on the train, unfortunately, and because we're just a brand new startup. Right. And um, by the time I, we got our, our music together those recordings i sent you that was late uh, late um late june uh everything's booked up until september and uh then in los angeles uh all the national touring acts are getting up and running and they're going to be hitting la in september and october for the most part and right. october is the craziest month I've ever seen in my entire life like basically anybody who ever put out a record in history is coming and playing in Los Angeles by October. Right. So it's it's nuts. So um, I don't even want to book any gigs because even if even if there were, I mean, a I want to go to shows every weekend in October. B, if if we got a gig and played, nobody would come to it because they're going to be out seeing another band. Right. So, and I I feel like that's kind of par for the course for the rest of the year. So um, I think Astral Arc is. You know, I'm going to press along with it through the end of the year, but I think uh, a lot of the, you know, I, I, I had a lot of big plans, you know, in April and May for the band. And right. um, uh, I think those are, you know, like we, we, I actually thought we would be up and touring uh, full time right. uh, by July. And uh, that just became an impossibility. So, I think I think things are looking like I'll I'll be doing that more in in 2022, but right. um, you know I'm I'm still I would like us I would like to see those songs find some kind of life, you know maybe out on college radio throughout the country. So I'm I'm busy trying to contact radio stations through the country right now. Um, well, it 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 sounds perfect for that kind of you know. 
I guess that marketplace, you know, and I mean, I like how they're, you know, they got a lot, a lot of things going, but in a, in a short kind of short time, you know, I think what it. Yeah, don't bore I want to say the chorus. You know, it's like, but it's like, sometimes you know, sometimes I love those kind of songs, you know, that where it's like it's right to the point, but then there's sometimes you know I like those long stretched out. You know, oh yeah. Well, to you me, you know, so it's like, I, I think it's it sounds better if it's really coming from the heart. It goes beyond like four or five minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, because if you if you, if you force it, you know, I think the audience can tell. Yeah. They say, oh, you know, you're doing it. That's a five minute song on the album. You stretch it out to thirty. It's like, why? You know. Sometimes I mean, it works. I mean, you know, that, that I mean, in a way, I feel like that is a good thing because I feel like the songs are vehicles, you know, and right. there's there's how you record it. And that's a statement. And you're saying one thing and you're getting one thing done with that. But then when you take it into a live scenario, you can play with it and modulate it. For instance, um, you know, Arrows in the Air, which is the one song I sent you is like a two minute recording and it's right pretty, you know pretty quick in and out on the recording but when we have played it live you know the first time that we played it we did stretch that out to 15 minutes 10 minutes i think we, you know we did right. a big bass jam and then that space jam went into counting out time i think or no maybe we did loose lucy i don't know we we did we did some big jam and then went into it and that was really effective i like that i like I like letting the songs breathe after they're written and not really forcing them. Um, and uh, Kaleidoscope Collector actually is a really fun launching point too, because on the record, you know, we get into this flurry at the end, and then it and then it, the song stops. But live, we just keep that going, and it's a giant funk jam, and and oh, it's, yeah, so I, that's I, really good. it's fun. Yeah, but it to me it, it sounds like. Um, it's a natural thing for you to do it. Yeah. Um, and also too, I, I, I also agree about, you know, you got your studio thing. Now at the time that it was done, it's now, it now it's immortal in a way. Mm -hmm. It's right there. Right. That's how you, how you recorded it. Mm -hmm. But maybe six months or seven months down the line, you're going, ah, I should have put something else in there. No, that's no, where you can no, that's no. where you can do it live where you can yeah. go okay you know like the studio i forgot to, you know you don't say that to the audience i forgot something you know you tell to your bandmates that hey we should have done something right here right in the middle you know yeah. or right at the end you know and then that's when you that's when you go for it you know yeah. but when you're when you i think when you force it it doesn't sound good when it's forced you know, no, you, you want can't. you want you gotta it to let, flow. You gotta let the song tell you what to do. Exactly, and um, that's you know those two songs right there. You know, I it's it's almost like it's early seventies stuff, but now you know it's Ooh. like it's well, that's, you know that's my deal. <laughs> and and I, I like that. I like that when we can go back. I mean, I think a lot of bands are looking back because right now I, I don't like to diss but pop music as it's, it's going now is basically punch here punch there punch there and then sing and then tweak it and then it's out as a hit yeah there's i mean it's almost like all, all you need is uh okay if i do that behind the scenes we got to go find someone you know, like a GQ model to go out there and sing it. Yeah. You know, so we had, you know, you know, and it's like, I'm not going, you know, I want to hear music as it was intended, made yeah. with, made by musicians, not yeah. by people behind the console, you know. Yeah. Not kids doing their hip hoppy with their blip loop boxes. I mean, I, I'll tell you one thing years ago, I mean, I, I never got into hip hop or rap. But when what's his name, 
you remember when they used to do those unplugged sessions on MTV? You know, mm -hmm. and I'm going to MTV because this is the anniversary. Um, and LL Cool J was doing that. Oh, that I was, was like, rad. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, with those musicians, he took what he did, it's basically studio manipulations, you know, and sampling and he got this band to back him up and it's like I mean, it's hard yeah i'm like going why can't people do you know now why can't they do it why are we relying on uh on others you know or it's like not so much relying but why are the people that are talented that can do it they don't got the spotlight no more i mean if you were up in 1971 doing this stuff, the spotlight would be on you right now, you know, but they don't care because, you know, you're, you know, you're, how did they say, you're playing dinosaur rock. Oh, and, yeah. I don't but, but, but you're not, you know, you're taking, you're taking what happened and you're bringing it up, you know, because a lot of the equipment that you're using now, they didn't have back then. So you can, and do things yeah. and still sound pure. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's what I love about, you know, the kind of music you do and, uh, and our friend Matt, you know, and, and then all the other, bro. all this, you know, then, you know, King Crimson, uh, and ba you know, bands that are staying true to creating music. Who cares if what they call it they're, saying, yeah. they're playing real music you know well none of it's planned or thought out i mean it's just uh i've it's been very there have been very few occasions in in my history where joel martin's musical tastes have matched up to what was happening as it was happening you know like out of the womb you know my favorite stuff i was born in 72 by the time I was 10, most of what I loved, you know, was the Beatles or, you know, you know, even by the time I was 10 in 1982, Led Zeppelin had already broken up. And I would right. say by the time I was 10, my favorite stuff was Led Zeppelin and the Beatles and stuff like that. Deep Purple in the 70s, Black Sabbath in the 70s, The Doors, you know, right. by, by the time I was in my early and then when I got into Prague, you know, at 14 and 15 and 86 and 87, my favorite stuff was Yes in the 70s, King Crimson in the 70s, uh, Genesis in the 70s. You know, like I was always a decade or two decades behind what, you know, what was happening, you know, and so, and that just became an exponential situation. I mean, you know, every, every six months or every year or so i'll say hey maybe you should go look at the top 10 and see what's going on and like i'll look at it and it's just not even sorry everybody likes what they like i don't i don't I, it's not even music you know i can't even understand what most of it is like and you know it's weird to say but i i would put if anybody is watching this and likes the music that we like go look at the top 10 and go play it you know bring it up on a youtube thing and ask yourself if you can even handle listening to any of it for more than a second i mean every once in a while someone has a fun you know like all the single ladies all the single hey that, that's great to play every once in a while for a fun thing but who's right. gonna go sit down and like oh man i'm so excited to go listening to uh the new katy perry i've never said that once uh right you know, and, but that, um, but that music, are, that music yeah, is yeah, back. Yeah. That music is just background. Yeah, you I know, really it, like that Miley Cyrus. I think she's a you know a real interesting gal. But I'm not probably not going to go sit down and listen to something that she does. You know, right? right. Quality listening time. Uh, so you know, no one's ever done it better than the Beatles. Period. End of story. And then people have done it different. And there's prog rock, and there's all of that stuff. You know, right. for me, and again, my taste, um, I like the sound of what people did in the 70s and the way people wrote. I like what Yes was doing in the 70s. I don't like the sound of modern progressive rock. You know, there's a lot of bands doing whatever they're doing now. 
it's not textures that I really enjoy, you know, like when people bring in like metal guitars or in progressive metal, I don't really enjoy. I like symphonic progressive rock and people that are doing it now, it's interesting because there's bands like Anecdote who I just love to the moon and they keep that spirit and they do it. Oh yeah, they, pe- they keep it alive. You yeah. know, and there's, and there's a I few, there's they're a not few, the biggest thing in the world, you know? I, I get what you're saying because there's a lot of the prog bands that, you know, while they sound technically fantastic, they go by, I keep on hearing this thing, Og by numbers. Yeah. You know, and it's like, oh, here, we got to do this part, you know, we're, or, or the thing that I've been tell, one thing I've been saying is like, you know, oh, if you don't have a 20 minute song, you lose your prog credentials, you know, it's like, yeah. no. It's like they, it's like they, they're taking what came before them, and they're just kind of making up new rules about it. And it's like it's got to come out of you naturally. Mm-hmm. It's got, it's got, you know, I mean, you know. And there's quite a few. I gotta say that um, I can't name them off the top of my head, but there's quite a few bands that it sounds like. They're such naturals, you know, and um, there's one that uh, when I was still living in L.A., uh, they were, these kids were like in high school, like juniors and senior, no, sophomore and juniors. So the father of the keyboard player, he had to sign permissions for them to go play in little clubs. Who is this? This is a band called The Source. They sounded like the 70s, all natural. And um, they're no longer together. They did, they did uh, the keyboardist did something a little different. Uh, and then I think he's just concentrating on, on life and school and stuff like that. But, well, how old is he now? He's probably in college age, 20. Okay. One twenty-two, something like that. I mean, what's his name? Oh, you know, I can't remember. I'm always looking for a good keyboardist. Um, I don't know. I, I I've spoken with this with his dad a couple of times. Mm-hmm. And he says right now is not a good time. You know, he said because I wanted to get him onto the show, mm-hmm. to talk about because I've been I was I think I went to about maybe ninety percent of their show because. Mm-hmm. Their father always called, uh, emailed me, and he goes, "I'll have tickets right at the door for you." Uh, you know, I meant, you know, because I really, you know, I, I reviewed their CDs, and he really liked it. So mm-hmm. um, he kept me up. And nicest bunch of kids. I mean, these got um, the guitarist plays like Steve Howe. But not, he's not emulating Steve Howe. He's t- he went back to what Steve Howe was into. Mm-hmm. And he went from that point. He wasn't going from the Steve Howe point. He was going from right. where, where yeah. Steve Howe was influenced by. Yeah. You know, I think it was, uh, but you know what I'm saying? It's like he yeah. went he went to the source, you know, their band, the source. He went, they went to the source, yeah. you know, and, um, Got the influences from where their 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 bands that they love, and it's yes and stuff like that, where they got their inspiration from. They went to that point, hmm. and to me, for 16, 17 year old kids to do that, I was just so blown away. And then um, to hear what they did, and then to hear them play live wow. was like, I mean. They would have fit perfectly in 1972. Mm. Perfectly. I mean, they they would have been right there with those peer those uh, the peers of that time. Mm. It just they just had that sound, and they were an LA band. You know, it was so cool. It's like so LA has so many musicians, fantastic musicians from different genres, mm. and. Um, some some made it, some didn't, you know, and some made it and then 
became obsolete for some whatever reason, you know. So it's like it's it's a tricky area because you know they LA is one of those Welcome to my machine, life. Yeah, LA is one of those machines that you know it'll chew you up and spit you out, you know. And but you know it's sometimes sometimes people when that happens to them. They get stronger and they come out with better music. And I really kind of think where you're at. You know, mm-hmm. you I've heard some of your um clips of stuff. Uh was it that band The Running Jumps? Mm-hmm. I've heard some of that, and then I hear what you're doing now. It's like, okay, this guy's he's not stuck in a mode like a lot of these bands are that they'll just do the same albums over and over again. Yeah. You know, uh, no fun for me the, the the audience we want to hear something new yeah. even though even though we want to be in a safe zone but we also want something new all right well a lot's yeah. happened since the running jumps i mean i'm a different person you know uh just uh what can i say i mean i got you know first and most important thing is that i got on the bus and i've become you know really sort of blown away by the amazing jam band scene where I think, you know, it's it's like the 60s renaissance of jazz musicians, you know, how everybody was hot and young coming up in the late 60s and early 70s. And then I think I feel like the the jam band scene is a good metaphor for that. I think all the best musicians in the world are in the jam band scene right now. So over the last six, eight years, you know, I've become more into that and um, and uh, you know, because that kind of encapsulates everything. And a lot of the people that are going to go come out and see the jam band music will be really accepting to other things that are kind of around that. For instance, you know, I can take a band that's sort of a jam vehicle, but I can do proggy things in it and they don't mind. Whereas a prog crowd, sorry, prog crowd might not appreciate a lot of the jam band stuff. But, you know, if you're in the jam band scene, you can kind of go out and do all of it. And so, you know, there's stuff that I can't get rid of that's just in my DNA, which is I really like jangly 60s sounding music, you know. Um, And so that comes out whether I want it to or not. And then, um, you know, the, the, the new thing just seems like it's built to play you know, Astral Arc just seems like it's built to go around and play. You know, we we want to play multiple sets. We want to play all night. We want to take the listener on a real trip and uh, and do stuff. Uh, so, you know, it's, you know, there's a sense with Astral Arc that it can do anything, you know, period. Um, you know, it, it, who knows what it's going to be in five years. It could be a 10 people band, you know, whatever, right. whatever my budget is at the time is going to dictate it, what it is. Whereas the running jumps, I literally had a vision telling me to work with the three other people that were in the band and I invited them and they agreed. I had a, I had, a, I had a, I had a dream that said, oh my new band is the running jumps right and it was these three people in it and i asked them and they wanted to be in it so the running jumps were that band you know it was it was my great buddy dave johnstone uh who i still play with all the time during the pandemic i started releasing singles every month Um, yeah i remember that yeah and uh dave is on quite a bunch of those and then um you know, uh, I'll, I'll come back to another point with Dave, but I also, I do a lot of live streaming and Dave has been my only guest that I've had up here in my space pod, which has been really special <laughs> for me. Um, but uh, then also Sid Jordan, who's one of my favorite bass players in the world, um, you know, played bass and, and my great, he was in a wonderful band in LA called Mini Bar and then did a lot of session work and producing. And then my friend Todd McDermott played keyboards and guitar, and he's just an incredible musician, great singer too. And um, so that's what that was. It was very much like I needed to work with those three people at that moment. And I was the band leader and we were playing my songs, you know, it was my gig. 
but you know that was the band and when you know it didn't make sense anymore to have us all playing together that band went away you know so it's just it's just like when, you know, unfortunately, when some of your favorite bands, when a band member dies, you know, like Led Zeppelin's not going to play after John Bonham is gone. Right. You know, when that band, when, when that band was not going to be those three people, it was like, okay, well, that's the end of that band. I, I, don't, I don't need to carry on the running jumps. Whereas Astral Arc, I really feel like Astral Arc is going to be where I'm at for another, you know, however long I get to be here on the planet, I'll probably be putting out Astral Arc records, you know. So. Astral Arc? You know, it, the way you just said that, it's like the running jump seems to have been a fixed point, whereas Astro Art can, as a flow, it can do it can do more because you're not saying I am a specific aisle. You know, yeah. I'm, you know, it's you're fluid in it. You know, you're going to go. And that's, that's what I noticed for me as a listener. As I'm growing older, I'm more into different styles of music than I was, say, when I was 25. When I was 25, I was only in, into one style of music at a time. I mean, from 25 to about 31, 30, I was, uh, I was into a certain style of music. I've gone the other way. And then that was, uh, you know, like my, my brief histories. Up until 1980, it was whatever my parents were playing on the radio, on the on the car radio. I didn't I didn't care. It didn't. It wasn't. What was that like? Tiny Tim and uh, Helen. No, Reddy. no, it's more like top 40 stuff. They they would listen to top 40. My dad would listen to the the jazz standards, you know, hmm. you know Sinatra and stuff like that. You know, you'd listen to those. Uh, but I wasn't really interested in music until 1980 when, you know, a friend of mine at my birthday party gave me Rush Permanent Waves. I keep on saying this. It's like, I feel like I'm a broken record, but it's like, it's, it was, at, it, it was at that point that I think he knew and he, maybe his was just a little nudge, just a tiny little nudge in that direction. And mm -hmm. after that, I got other things like I got, on cassette, classic hits, and then uh, Queen's Greatest Hits. Mm. And then I got the first ELP album, which I want to say, and, and probably others probably won't agree, that a lot of that was heavy metal. What? A lot of that. Just, a lot of that was heavy metal. Oh, oh just yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Just, just the way, especially the Barbarian. Oh, my God. Holy yeah. crap. I mean... Yeah. But dirge rock, the birth of the desert scene right there. I mean, to me, it was like, oh my God. So that was 82 ish. And uh, because now we're on the anniversary of MTV, my first um, out of the, you know, how you say the usual suspects that were played on classic rock, you know, KLOS, you know, mm -hmm. KMET back in the day, you know, yeah. those those stations but the, you know they also played the same kind of stuff you know you knew okay yes uh got some elp they played uh kansas you know bands like that so you knew, those were the usual suspects so 1985 on mtv when they played kaylee from marillion i mean that's when i oh. started to to jump right into that scene, but but I got I got um, detoured by a friend of mine for thrash metals for the next four years. I was into thrash metal exclusively. I got rid of anything that wasn't thrash in my my collection, so I was just exclusively that. I didn't look it. I didn't look like I was a metalhead. I mean, I had short hair, shorter than this. And um, so I didn't look it, but I was heavily into it. I was buying anything that was related to thrash metal. And um, then in 92, when I was working at a record store, that's when I got back into Prague because of that manager I was telling you about. Mm -hmm. And then 
then the first uh, Prague Fest in 93 at, uh, at UCLA, the Roy, oh, Royce Hall. I was there. I'm like, from that point on, I went off the deep end. I, that basically from 93, I went off the deep end, uh, or as people say, down that rabbit hole. And I'm keep, I'm still going down that. It's I'm more open. Hole. Yeah. And I'm more uh, open minded to hear when someone tells me about bands, you know, check these guys out. You might like it, you know, based on your you know, what you've been talking about. And I'm like, okay, okay. So my only, my only downfall is money. <laughs> I don't have enough to get all this stuff. Yeah, I know. You know, and, and I, it's like, I have this weird magic, uh, magical dream of that I snap my fingers and every CD that I ever want will just appear in my room. I mean, I won't be able to get into the room, but <laughs> it's like, I'll probably have tens of thousands of these things, you know. It's like it's there's just so soul seek, but don't tell anybody. I mean, I I just I go and listen to what people recommend, and I make up my mind: is that something that I need right now? And you know, whatever I need right now, I go and I get. Um, my latest thing that I delved into was uh, weather report. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and. Did you get that Jocko record? Um, not yet. I'm still. I think I'm that blow, I'm, I think that blows away all the weather report stuff. It's it's it's. Uh, I'm not going to diss weather report. Uh, they're great. They're geniuses. But uh, the Jocko is like a pure musical experience. I love it. It's inside and out, just incredible. Yeah, I got uh, the other one that I got, but I've had this for years, based on you know that that manager. Um, Maha Vishnu Orchestra. I have a few of theirs. And I'm like, you oh, go you know, with the first two. He, 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 he turned me on to that because, again, you know, John McLaughlin's guitar sound, it, it wasn't your, that typical guitar sound that went with that stuff, you know, the jazzy yeah. music, you know. I mean, I think I recall in magazines they were calling him and I now forgive me if I got this wrong Jimi Hendrix of jazz guitar that's fair you know and uh, I was like I always kept that in mind when I'm listening to him I'm like right, this is not a jazz guitarist this is a jazz guitarist through rock music you know and have it's you like, heard I got a record for you Tony Williams Lifetime uh, uh, is, I think it's Turn It On it's his, it's the second lifetime record. Have you ever heard that? No, I you know, I had a friend of mine when I was in it's better in than the, all the Mahavishnu, all the all the lifetime, like this now. Oh um there there is a preface with this record. Uh it's there's two different things that happen on this record. One is the most mind. I think it's like from seventy or seventy-one. Like it's 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 really early in terms of fusion. It's John McLaughlin playing like he's Tony Iommi, like it's oh. straight distorted fuzz guitar with Tony Williams. I'll tell you, there's one song on it that if you started at the beginning, you wouldn't be able to tell that it wasn't off of Piper at the Gates of Dawn. Oh wow. Yeah, it's that much of a mind bender. Um, but it's the core band is Tony, John McLaughlin, and Larry Young, the organist. So it's a trio for some of it. And then there's a, I think at the time he was totally uncredited. I could be wrong about that. But um, it's come out more that um, Jack Bruce is heavily on it as well. Oh, wow. And he sings at the end. He actually sings on one song that became a Mahavishnu orchestra song that John took to Mahavishnu. And then, um, so there's 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 six or seven songs that are the most incredible music you're ever going to hear. And then because it's Tony Tony's psychedelic record, there's about six or seven little thought piece spoken wordy poems which you know i'm sorry people might love that and i love tony and tony's incredible and blah 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 
but it's uh for me it's unlistenable like there's so there's like six <laughs> little unspoken word things that i just i have to move forward on i can't even listen to them but the right. music parts are the absolute most amazing i would say marriage of rock and jazz turn it on tony williams lifetime incredible yeah i i had, I had a friend of mine now this is the calling at the time while i was working at the record store uh actually even before uh it was another band out of my my hometown uh glendale california mm -hmm. and it was these two brothers one was played bass and once in a while played guitar and his younger brother played drums and in his room what he basically did they had a he had a big walk-in closet. He put his bed in there so that his rest of his bedroom will be filled with his drums. And he had a setup. Um, you know how keyboardists like to round themselves with the keyboards? Mm -hmm. He was surrounding himself. He had his acoustic drum set in front and his electronic drum set in the back. So he can spin around, you know, and go back and forth in you know, that. This kid was, um, at that time, it was, I think he was still in high school. And this guy was playing like a, a, a seasoned uh, musician. I mean, he was heavily into Prague and the uh, jazz fusion scene. I mean, his, I mean, one of his favorite drummers was, was Bruford. Mm -hmm. uh, then the other one, um, what was it? It wasn't Tony Williams. It was another big, kind of a big one uh, at that time. Um, but that's what he was into. And it was just so amazing. I mean, that, that, that there's times you find young people that that magic comes into them. And, you know, and I think that's so amazing. I think that's yeah. so amazing that, that a young person you know, every once in a while, you see a young person that uh, uh, I saw one on YouTube. Well, I don't remember. Let's, let's not forget Tony Williams was 17 when he started playing with Miles Davis. Oh, you yeah. Know, so it's like there's that. He redefined that, the vocabulary for jazz drummers. He was 17. Not just played, not just got hired. Redefined the vocabulary of jazz drumming at 17 and 18 before create helping create jazz fusion i mean when he was in his early 20s then you know it's like uh and, pretty good oh yeah it's 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 amazing that uh just how some of that that people's dna from such a young age they able to you know create such amazing music yeah and so you know it's there's, like I said, there's so much out there, you know, to get. Um, and but it's it's so nice to hear when uh, musicians start talking about what they what they're into, especially nowadays, you know. It, but it it also kind of sometimes you get almost it seems like a scripted, you know, it's like if you're a keyboardist. Oh yes, I like I like uh, Tony Banks, Rick Wakeman, uh, Keith Emerson. You know, it seems to be those those three names that right off any keyboardist you ask does what they'll say. Well, they but it's like good. so. I mean, they're good, you know. But it's like you got to have something else, you know. Those other keyboardists that you know that may not have been prog, but yeah, but you know, there's there's a lot out there. I mean, there's just some newer ones, uh, you know, ones that. But it just just seems like some of the answers, you know, I was giving that as an example. Some of the answers seem to be too scripted, and you you know, obviously, okay, the keyboards, okay, he, he likes those three, you know, it's obvious. But it's nice to hear when they, you know, kind of get step out of that, you know, the obvious, and get some you know, surprises of 
different kind of keyboards, you know. You know, so it's like you know, it's, it goes with drummers and bass players and guitarists and singers. That's the one thing with in Prague, and I'm sure you noticed this too. Especially in the '90s, there was a majority of those Prague bands that everybody either had to sound like Peter Gabriel or John Anderson. It's like there was so many of those clones out there, and yeah. I'm like going, "Oh my God!" It's like sing from your heart don't sing because you think you're gonna get uh get not noticed if you sound all your singers sounds like john anderson oh yeah you know well the, you know the, the rest of the that, band could be crap <laughs> that's just how we're you know as humans kind of wired in a way i mean you know yeah it's, it's like i mean in a way if you have a word for a genre that word only exists because there are copycats you know the first right you did whatever you're you know i don't well that's the one thing i, I like about this, but i don't i doubt bob mar you know did bob marley call himself right you know that bob marley was doing his thing and his stuff is so much more advanced than any other reggae artist oh yeah you know? so you know then you have a whole genre that's basically based around what he was trying to do while they avoid doing that you know and that's that's kind of how I feel about a lot of Prague is like, yes, we're, you know, John Anderson and Chris Squire were into the Beatles. They were into the 60s stuff. And then they started right. writing and they started making more advanced stuff, but they were hippies, you know, it's like, you you know, uh, it was only us that can change it, only us to rearrange it. You know, they were talking about peace and love. And then, yeah. you know, the Beatles, I would say the Beatles were the first Prague rock band because they were the first band doing stuff in a symphonic multi, you know, if you went and, you know, talked about all the thing, you know, all the ingredients of a great frog rock band, you know, symphonic, time signatures, uh, you know, virtuoso playing, you know, in, in or, or intriguing playing, right. you know, all these things, you know, or Sgt. Pepper, Magical Mystery Tour and stuff, uh, the White well, Album, you know, long form well, songs, you know, that's all stuff that the Beatles did. And so, you know, yes, we're writing in that mode. And then they, you know, really, you know, them and ELP and the nice, or I should say the nice really uh, yeah. created this thing and all the copyright cats are then progressive rock. And now you get 30 years removed, 50 years removed from it. And, you know, to me, all the current crop of people that are doing stuff kind of forgot the blueprint, you know, like I wish people right. would go back and listen to yes more. Like I'm really, I have, I have almost. Well, that's what, that's what I. That's the one thing that I know about you. Well, that's that's what I know about you is that you are being yourself. You're not trying to emulate anybody. You, you're me. I. I mean, I I might get this wrong, but it's almost like the music is just flowing out of you, and you then you capture it, but you don't. You don't sound like anybody, but you you know you can hear your influences. Yeah, you don't. You're not trying to emulate anybody. You're being yourself. You're yeah. saying these are my influences, but this is what I'm doing. Right. And that's that's something that you're following the blueprint. You know, you're following it, and you're you know it's like okay, you know, you're. How do you say at the at the ground level of it, like you know you're forgetting, in a way, kind of you're forgetting what came in the '70s. You're focusing on the late '60s, probably early '70s. You know, right there before, you know, as you say, the, the copycats or the imitators or whatever start coming up. Um, and I think that the biggest. The two uh, eras that, uh, the, or decades that we did hear more copycats was the 80s and 90s, mm -hmm. especially the 90s. The 90s, like, oh my God, you can hear 10 bands that sound like Genesis, 10 bands that sound like, yes, 10 bands that sound like Kansas, you know, stuff like that. And it's like, they have no... Um, you know they they got nothing 
it's almost like they're being a tribute band in a way. Right. Without playing the those bands' songs, it's like we're creating a song that sounds like uh, Roundabout, or we're creating a song that sounds like The Barbarian, or we're creating a song that sounds like, um, you know, uh, Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, you know, stuff like that. You know, you they're they're not doing their own stuff. Yeah. They're doing their like, you know, I love how you said it, the blueprint. They're not going by the blueprint. Yeah. Very few. It's as, as each decade goes on from the 70s. It's as if the blueprint is being pushed aside. You know, yeah. it's like just we don't have to go back to the beginning. We're going to go back to the, the second level or the third level, you know. And I think that's why they called Prague in the 90s. They call it the um, the third era or something like that because it wasn't necessarily neo prog but it wasn't prog you know it's like all these I think it's crazy it's like all these terminology you know yeah. terms that they give and it's like I used to fall prey to that you know and now it's like I don't I just like going okay if it's good for my ears I'm going to listen to it I don't care you know you know, it could be rock, it could be jazz, it could be pop, you know, punk, whatever it is. Yeah. If it sounds good, if it if it energizes me enough, you know, and I know it sounds corny, but you know, how there's people that uh, take substances, you know, to get that high. Right there is for me. That's this is what. I, I know it sounds corny, but this is the stuff. No. I, yeah. It's almost like, um, almost like a contact eye. Yeah. On it, call it. I mean, I get it off of all this stuff. So whatever these guys are smoking or recording or whatever, you know, to get their inspirations. I mean, I'm getting that contact eye off of them, you know, and it's like, I, I just love it. I mean. So able, you know, turn off the lights, put on the headphones, lay lay back, and just go to a different world. That's yeah, that's what I love about this music. You know, like the world that's going around behind you. <laughs> well, I should point out, uh, my sponsors are very kind to put me up today. Uh, you know, I've I've been doing a lot of live streaming for the whole pandemic, and uh, early on, uh, NASA Total Landscaping. And Jack Parsons Laboratory in Pasadena got together and decided to send a hippie into space. So I'm the first person that's worked out this program and it's been very successful. And today I got very lucky because there weren't, wasn't a lot of billionaire traffic up here in space. So uh, <laughs> my sponsors decided that I could come up here in my space pod and do the interview. So I'm actually in the first level orbit up here uh, talking to you. And this is where I do my Friday freakout show. Uh, which I do every Friday, as I have from March 20th, 2020. There's only been one Friday that I took off in that entire time. My second week off is actually this Friday, and that's because I'm going to King Crimson, uh, but then I'll be back on it. Um, I've done 182 shows over 72 wow. weeks. Um, I broadcast live on Facebook and YouTube. Um, I used to do three shows a week, one, another one I did on Facebook and YouTube, and then another one I did on Instagram. And now I'm just in my one show that I do every Friday night at 8 p.m. PST. And, uh, you know, for the uninitiated, um, you know, I have a really great small community of people that come and, and roll out to the shows. Uh, Scott here, one of our listeners is one of them, Chet. Uh, and, uh, but uh, it's a good crew of people to come out. And basically I learn, you know, because it's so much. And I mean, I literally have had a, several of those people have watched probably every show, you know, right. I've literally been tuning into every show that I've done. So I try to keep things really new and present. So every week I learn five or six new songs. And then I do a lot of space jams and improvisations. I have yeah, most, of, most of the time I, I watch you on my tablet, but mm -hmm. very few times when you're doing your YouTube, on YouTube, I, I watch it on my on my TV. 
Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It's so amazing. I got the I got the headphones on, and it's yeah. It is. I'm really lucky that I've been able to sort of maximize the technology around me uh, and uh, put on, you know, what I feel is a really fun, unique show. I mean, like, oh yeah, you know, a lot of people are live streaming, but I really, I, you know, in all fairness, I don't think anybody's doing what I'm doing. I mean, I've got a. I don't. I don't think so. And yeah. and also, too, you can tell. If anybody has not watched, when you go watch your first one, it's like you're transported back to a time. It feels like it's a time before tech, or modern technology. Sometimes and then you're utilizing Yeah, and you, but you're utilizing it. And it's like I'm, I'm watching. I don't remember when it was. I was watching how you, you know, you're using a lot of, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. Tri triggers or you know looping. i'm not using any triggers i'm or samples i'm looping live here in the studio yeah, okay so okay, I have, that's what it is so yeah i have um i have you know since i'm up here in the space pod and i still have all my instruments you know i i wish i could move the camera around but i actually have a small percussion kit i have taurus one bass pedals here just like just like uh rush and genesis had I have right. an, I have an old Mellotron 400 that's sitting right in front of me. Um, I have a pedal steel. I play guitar. I play bass, and I run everything into the PA, and I run it into a looping unit. So um, I'm playing everything live, and then that whole send goes out to a Pro Tools station, and then that station goes out to an audio device that goes into the computer. So I'm sending a fully pro studio signal yeah that's that's uh, what coming into the computer and then it's a th three camera three cameras when they work uh video shoot you know so um you know i think it's a I pretty think, dynamic and fun thing it's usually a two hour yeah I, can, I saw I, I don't remember when it was but i saw um one of the times when you're doing all that and i saw it was like, you know how like a little kid when they do something to like, I saw that look on your, on you like you're going, it's like, okay, watch this, you know, oh, I'm going to do that, you know, it's like, and it's like, you're being professional, but at the same time, you are having so much fun up there. Yeah. And it's like, you know, for a non-musician, I envy that because it's like, you'll be able to create, you know, out of nothing, you're creating things. And, you, you know, it's like, I wish more people would be creative, yeah. not not writing on the coattails of what came before, you know. Well, you I'm know. my the, the greatest thing about this entire process and the live streaming and the COVID and the whole thing uh, is that I've developed this community of people that come and watch these live streams. And they are such a fun bunch. And they push me, you know, like, so that's, that's what you're seeing is me trying to impress uh, this really fun core bunch of people that all have incredible yeah. taste, you know, so it's like, I, I, my whole goal is to do something that will amuse them. Uh, yeah. You know, and, you know, I mean, like I said, I'm learning five or six brand new songs every week as I have for 72 weeks. So I'm actually up to playing about 850 unique songs uh, that I've learned and gotten together in this format for the pandemic. Uh, you know, so not all of it is well done. You know, I, I submit this humbly. I, I, I mess up all the time. I don't do, you know, it's very little rehearsal, very little prep time, especially when I was doing my three shows a week. You know, that meant that I was learning at that time, I was learning 10 to 15 songs every week and trying to put together two, two to three hour shows in addition to another 60 to 90 minute show every week, nonstop. And, I, I and, was how, and how many shows, how many shows have you done again today? I've done about, a, I've done 182 shows. Okay. And yeah, most, I, of, most of those are two to three hours. Yeah. yeah, a lot of the Instagram well, shows when I was doing those were an hour, and then that kind of grew to ninety minutes. But like Friday night, I did a Jerry Garcia tribute, and that was four hours. 
And I still can't believe that I did it. You know, it's, it's I don't it's, what time time flies. It's like you're having yeah. a lot of you're having fun, and it's like you don't want to stop. And it's like, um, it's just the same as you know. I should let everybody know that on November fourth, twenty twenty, this gentleman right here was my first guest. Oh yeah. So you know, and so your guest, you were guest number one, and now you're guest number thirty four. You know, 34. it's like four. Wow. Good job. Yeah. So um, it's, I have to owe this, doing this show really honestly because of the pandemic. Yeah. Because a majority of everybody that I've had on probably wouldn't have been available to do something like this because they were, they would be busy planning their tours and, and, uh, and whatnot, you know, there's some bands that have actually done nothing during the pandemic because yeah. their members are too far apart from each other. Yeah. And they probably didn't have the their good enough technology to yeah. do live streams and things like that. Hopefully those bands will now be able to, you know, especially since, you know, I, I got to say, out of any community of people, the Prague community uh, seems to be pro-health. Mm. You know, we want to be healthy. Yeah. So everybody's, everybody's doing what they need to do so that we can get back on track, you know, so the, the audience can be able to see their bands that they love. That's good. On, uh not in where right now we're in a selected mode yeah you know it's all it's almost like this is like the test the testing ground to see what is gonna basically be for 2022 at least that's that's how i'm getting it i mean i mean things like what was it ross best could have done something this year but they've been you know responsible and doing it for next year mm -hmm. uh what was it Frog stock is they're doing the thing. They're doing it in a select a smaller theater than they did previous years. But they're also doing live stream of it. So it's like I honestly think live stream is health wise is the future, but also too is if people can't afford to come places like that, you know, and they want to see the bands that are being, you know, let's say like Ross Bass, we want to see those bands, but you know, a lot of us can't afford to fly in, you know, just, you know, have a ho expensive hotel. I mean, the only thing that's not really expensive, you really get down to it, is ticket prices for what you're getting. Yeah. So the next, I think the next best thing is uh, live stream. You know, get the people that can't get to you. Now here's a way you can actually see your favorite band. Yeah. You know, but you know, it's like I think we're in the early stages of all of this. And but I I really think that, that can be the future. I mean, I, I mean, it'll get to a point that, you know, now that you I'm sure you know quite a few musicians that have been vaccinated that you can say, hey, you want to come on? Yeah. You know, and yeah. it can you can do like a full band type of situation, you know. Yeah. But you know, you're you're lucky in the location that you live in that there is so many musicians that you can you can okay. get, and some of them outside of the genre that you're into. Oh yeah. And you would you would be surprised at I was surprised um you know the drummer from Anthrax at all the different um influences it's the weirdest yeah. one i thought when he did that um we would max on Rhinon or oh Rhiannon, yeah oh Rhiannon. when he did when they did that i'm like going what the hell i'm Charlie like this is fucking badass i love him i actually I've, and, I've i've gotten to hang out with him and um i went to a show that anthrax was playing at and uh um I was wearing a Red Cross shirt, and uh, 
uh, Charlie Freak when he saw it, and we just talked power pop for an hour. Yeah, I mean, talked. this guy, Holy this guy is a, he goes deep. He's a real cool dude. And and you know, up until these, you know, those lockdown videos that he's done, I never knew he could play guitar or bass or. I or need to watch come. those. I haven't really seen any. I mean, to be honest, my you, you could. My pandemic experience was seven days a week. Me putting on my shows, I barely got right. to watch anybody. So, oh yeah, you you were you were I, busy. I, you were a busy bee. <laughs> yeah, I I kind of I had to I have I only took one week off the entire time, and uh, and that's doing other outside projects too. You know, like I would get I I I, I oddly enough I I tend to make a lot of my living playing pedal steel for people and oh yeah I, I record tracks for people at home plug uh and um you know uh you know i would get like maybe one of those every week or every other week and so you know then i have to tear down my live experience and uh set up to record pedal steel and you know it's like i would do that on a day and the other six days and seven days were prepping for my shows and even oh, yeah. now that I'm still doing my one show, you know, like I'm doing gigs out in the real world and who knows if we're going to get to continue that. But, you know, I'm trying to, I still have to spend many hours a week prepping my Friday show. So, you know, it's, 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 it's a shame because, you know, for me, I mean, like my, I'm a music fan first. I mean, that's why I do all this stuff is just because right. I just love it so much. And I really don't get to go out and see people play very often, really. And I don't get to watch the live streams that I want to see because, you know, my first top order of business is doing my show and making it a fun show. And everything it- after that kind of falls in line. And so, unfortunately, I haven't got to see Charlie's. Um, Oh yeah, they're, they're they're a lot of fun, and you know, just to hear, see, find out his the different music that he's into. You know, yeah. you'd think with the style that he plays that he's only going to be into that, you know, into yeah. metal, but he's into so much more, and that's that's it's so nice. It's kind of like a revelation. It's like saying, okay, it's like, hey, we the music community of whether you're a pop band or a metal band. In some ways, you guys, you know, you go like this in a way, you know, yeah. because one likes the other, even though, you know, one could be a pop band, but they could be, you know, in the true sense, a metal band, and the other metal band, in the true sense, you know, like you're saying, a power pop band, you know, it's like, it's so, it's just so cool. Hey, well, you know, what's rad is, I don't know if you saw it, but last week, um, there was some article about, you know, Bruce Dickinson from Iron Maiden, you know, what are Bruce Dickinson's biggest influences? And, you know, there's a top 10 list of him, of uh, interview clips of him. And he talks about how much he loves Vandergraaff Generator, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, like, like Peter Hamill was his like second biggest influence. He loved Toll, you know, like his favorite records are Toll and, um, and uh, Vandergraaf, you know, so fucking cool. And, and Ian Gillen and 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 uh, Deep Purple, and you know, he right. talked about meeting Ian early in his career, and Ian being very supportive, and um, you know, it's just like, you know, it's just really cool to see, because Maiden was really huge in my life growing up, you know. And, uh, oh yeah, yeah, we were talking about him. yeah. They were my uh, second concert, and then I was at two of the three uh, live after death shows. You know, I was I was at the, and I'm gonna dig out that um, that tour book. I was at the one the somewhere in time tour. Oh, I, got, right. I still got that tour book. It's a little beaten up on the edges, but I have my I still, Power Slave and I have my Peace of Mind tour books. I got those. I was I was. 11 years old and in the Iron Maiden fan club and the whole that was deal. that was that was my first metal concert um before that my very first concert that I went to was over at the at the Greek theater it was Berlin and Talk Talk who Berlin and Talk Talk who was the first band Berlin 
Oh, Berlin. Oh, Berlin. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. And that was in 1983. Was yeah. My junior year, I went to all by myself. Oh, I was scared. Wow. I was scared. I'd never been to something like that before by myself. I mean, there was a couple concerts after that that I could have gone to. And one was, yes, it was going to be in uh, 19, 1984. Wow. Got the tickets because my friend said, oh, yeah, I'll put, you know, get the tickets. I'll, you know, you know, Got my driver's license. I'll drive. I said. Oh. Week before, I can't go. I'm not going. I can't get to this place. I think it was a perform. Mm. I can't get there. You know, my parents aren't going to drive me because you know it's on a on a school night. So I wound up. Uh, I, you know, pre-internet trying to find someone to buy these tickets yeah and um so it's like i i found someone to, that was in you know some uh some guy that uh you know he he had not as long hair as yours but i was like going, you know here here we were stereotyping and saying, okay he's gonna like want to go see yes <laughs> he's gonna want to go see i asked him, i said i got two tickets for yes you know i think that was like well, 50 or something like that. So 25, I said, you know, I said, you want them from 20? You know, I just gave it for a little less. Oh, yeah, cool, dude. Pulled out a $20 bill. You know, here, here you go. Hated that. Another oh. another missed concert, but it wasn't on my end. My cousin and I were going to go see Sticks. I think a, few, a year or so later. But it was at, I forget where it was. It wasn't the form, Sports Arena. Oh wow! And I think I think it was there but at the time. Tommy Shaw broke his arm, so they canceled the show. And they said we're not sure when we're going to come back around. So either you can hold on to the ticket, or you know, cash it in for the, you know, cover price. You know, and I said, I'm going to come back. And you know, I at the time I still wasn't driving, and I didn't really have, you know, reliable transportation. So. So I was back, so I didn't get to see those two bands. But you know, after that, I got to go. I went with a friend to go see Iron Maiden. Great show! That was so fantastic. Mm. I believe it wasn't Iron Maiden. It was Ozzy Osbourne. He had that Vinnie Vincent invasion. Mm. That was <laughs> crap. <laughs> that was crap. I, I don't know, but it was, it was, I mean, the LA, it was, you know, it's such a vast place, but everything is close but because of the traffic. Yeah. It makes it feel like it's 10 times further away, you know? Oh, I know. And that's the only thing I don't miss about LA is that traffic and in the summer when it gets triple digits, I mean, I, I swear but you know I mean I traded it for somewhere a little more quiet mm. and that's what I get I get quiet you know don't have really there's no club scene here yeah um, the only thing down at the waterfront the river um, not last year but previous years we have uh, waterfront concerts but it's either country bands uh, hip hop bands, or what you call the, um, the, not the top forty, but the greatest hits bands. You know the mm -hmm. ones that haven't put out an album in years or maybe decades, right. and they're just writing the, their own coattails. They got that, and once in a while there was like this extreme metal festival with all these bands that sound like they're singing with a. Um, with dirt in their mouth, you know, it's like, I mean, there's some I can tolerate, but not every single band and not every band where they're all in your face from the first second that they start playing, you know, there's like no, nothing dynamic to it. It's just all, 
you yeah. know, just like a wall of sound. And so nothing comes up that, but that place would be so perfect for mm. rock festival or something like that. I mean, it was so perfect. It's right there on the river. You got the nice scenery. Yeah. It's outdoors, so people can picnic. Oh, well, no. Go some shows. Do some booking. If you build it, it will come. I need I need the money for something get like some, that to get the get some sponsors. Crawl around, you know. I mean, that's the oh. nice thing about where you are. At least you know you're. You might not have anything in your actual immediate city, but you're not too far away from other big cities. You know, it's like Austin is about four four or five hours. Yeah, how far away is New York? Um, maybe about six. Six to eight, you know. I want to say six to eight hours. Because mm. when I came across, uh, the second time I came to Maine, took the bus. Don't ever take the bus cross country. Yeah. You're in a cramped little space. Here's your legs. It's like barely yeah, you gotta be ready you're cramping that. up. And, and they don't. Now, that was 2007. They don't do what they did. You remember you seen the old uh, movies and TV shows where people stop on their bus stops. They stop off at a restaurant or something like that. We stopped off at McDonald's, Burger King, and then the then the then the bus uh, the Greyhound stations. They had their own little um, cafes in there. Mm. With jacked up prices. Oh, horrible. So on the way back, I just bought a whole bunch of, you know, those formal microwave dinners that you don't have to refrigerate or freeze. You know, did that. So I saved money that way, but it's like unless you got the time. Yeah. Five days to get across country. Yeah, it's a good deal. My good buddy Jay Morgan just logged on. What's up, buddy? Jay's the first drummer I ever played with. Oh, cool. Yeah. That's a that, good that's... on Friday. He's into Prague. Oh, cool. You guys got gonna... an early concert, buddy. That's that's the one thing I gotta tell you is in LA, whenever I went, it's like to any of those Prague festivals. Uh even if you're not like like a close friend to these people. When you get there, it's like, hey, you know, you point to each other, you know, like. Well, music is the great unifier. You know, if you meet someone that has the same record collection, you can talk to them, you know. Oh, yeah. Years, and and cool. I remember there was, a, uh, I don't remember the year now, but there was a, a pre prog fest or at uh, Barnsdale Park. The, the, there was like that little theater that they have uh, there and a band, a Mexican band called cast c-a-s-t hmm. uh a la band called land's end oh yeah and i forget it was someone else but it was those three they played and i was like oh my god land's end you might might uh check out on on youtube because they're kind of like a pink floyd jammy band hmm. you know they they kind of they kind of cross line some at some point they said when the singer sings they sound like a neo a neo prog band mm -hmm. but when they when the singer stops and then they start it's like a combination of like like uh uh pink pink floyd and some jam jam bands kind of mesh mesh together and it's like they, they put out a few albums and they, cool. really cool guys but at that place i pulled up and this guy was blasting on his car stereo uh gentle giant plate playing the pool and i was like this incredible sounds, record. this sounds so awesome i asked yeah. what, who is this and again that's the other thing you know at rock concerts he'll uh he came out of his car he, he opened up his car and it clouded comes out and he goes, this is General Giant, man. This is cool. And I go, what well who what what album? I said, you know, I knew it was a live album. So he told me and it's like, oh yeah, you know. 
That's my um, go-to Gentle Giant record. Yeah, and it's like, I, I mean, it. it's just amazing. All these different, you know, the, the community, the prog community, I guess in the same way as, you know, with the, you know, the, the Sunset Strip band, you know, you got their community and it's like everybody's got their communities of, yeah. you know, even if you, you're not in regular contact with it's as if time didn't go by, you know, it's like, you know, you, you, you pick up from the time, last time you saw him, maybe it was a few months ago or a year ago, but it's almost like, you know, you're right back into, into the groove of, you know, friendship and everything. And that's, that's the one thing I, I loved about going to all those shows. Oh, amen. Yeah. You got to meet new people too, you know. Hey, if anybody watching has any questions or anything, you know, yeah. fire them off here. I'm I've got an eye on my Facebook, so uh, you know, I would love to yeah. interact with some folks. Uh, uh, I know there's three people in the room, but I don't yeah, know who we've been, we've been holding tight at a pretty steady three. You know, we got we got we we blew Wait, up. Chet. Oh, we lost someone. Who did we lose? Damn it, Chet, are you still there? <laughs> come on, Chet. Jay, come on. You can ask anything to this guy. I mean, this guy. You, the way I first found out about you is through our, a mutual friend, Matt Brown. Yeah. You know, and the instrument that you're always doing was the the, the pedal. Yeah, you know, pedal steel, pedal steel and then when I saw you start doing other instruments, I was like, well, wow, this is pretty damn cool. Yeah. You know, I, that's that's the one thing I, I love about some musicians. They just come out, you know, you, you see them on one instrument, all of a sudden they're doing other instruments. And you say, wait a second, I didn't know you could do that. You know, so it's it's like, I mean, you, in a sense, are a true musician because you could probably... I, 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 you know, I don't want to put words in my mouth, in your mouth, but uh, I bet you, you probably could pick up any instrument and within a short amount of time, know yeah. it as if it was a primary. Well, you know, it's been, it's been a real wild road, a long, strange trip. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky about how I learned music. You know, I, I got in pretty young I mean I was 11 when I started playing guitar and uh started studying with a great teacher this guy Carl Grossman in Hermosa Beach right away and then by the time I was 15 I had dropped out of school and was going to uh Grove School of Music and uh got a really good foundation there and to be honest I and I will always say this getting into progressive rock as a teenager i think did really incredible things for my brain because you know here i was at 15 trying to learn part of the sunrise which by the way in 1985 that meant taking your 33 and a third lp <laughs> and trying to record it into a tape deck that had a slow down function on it and then slowing it down and trying to learn you know the, the no tutorials very little magazine action was coming out with transcriptions very little correct tab um so you know uh uh it was very hard to go learn this stuff you had to really develop your ear you know and and um so trying to get my brain around learning that material that I loved so much was, was yes, uh, Rush, you know, learning all that stuff by ear and learning those hard formats, hard, long format songs. You know, my buddy Jay was that guy that I would go then play all this Rush with, you know, and at one point, you know, when we were in school together, uh, I just remember we had, we had, we, we were both in the high school jazz band, but our band department was was kind of falling apart for a bunch of different reasons so that band class never really happened and then we had lunch and then i had like a free period and like literally all that would happen is you know fifth period we would set up our gear and then um we would jay and i and maybe a bass player one of our friends we would sit there and play rush through fifth period our lunch period <laughs> and sixth period 
you know, every day we would just pick a record, you know, what's it going to be today? Let's play hemispheres. And we would just play down hemispheres while all these other bored kids sat and did their homework and used it as a free period, <laughs> you know, we would just sit there and shred. So, um, uh, you know, that's, that's how I learned music. So, uh, and then oddly enough, uh, in, when I was in my very, very late twenties, probably, I wish I had a better recollection of this, but I was just getting into a lot of records that, um, had pedal steel on it and it had never been in, you know, growing up in LA through the eighties and the nineties pedal steel was something I never even heard about or never thought about. I thought about lap steel. I heard people do that, but I don't think I even knew what a pedal steel was. And then all of a sudden I was hearing this unearthly texture in these records. And I was like, what's that? And then I started to go down that rabbit hole real deep. And, you know, it was through the Neil Young records that have the great thing Keith on steel. And then uh, there's a guy named Greg Lease, who's a world famous uh, session guitarist who was doing a lot of great records. He was on Matthew Sweet's records and that, that as a power popper, I loved those. And so he was featured on those, which was sort of an odd, you know, co uh, combination. And um, then I would listen, then I started going out trying to find the great steel guitarists. And that got me really into classic country because that's really where the best steel guitar playing was, right. you know, and, and it's such a weird juxtaposition because you would have these, you know, country artists from the sixties and seventies doing cowboy country where you would think, oh, you know, maybe these, these hicks don't know much about music or whatever, you know, and, you know, they're only playing a few chords and cowboy country chords, but then you would get the virtuoso of the band would be the pedal steel player. And, you know, the pedal steel players that were playing in classic country in the 60s had to be probably the best musicians, the overall best musicians of anybody on any instrument at any time, you know, because it's such a weird instrument to get into and learn and become masterful at and then you know you're you if you're playing in country bands you have to be a really adept improviser and you have to be extremely sensitive to what's happening because you're playing off of you're largely improvising over what the vocal is doing you're 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 a foil you know the the pedal steel it uh, uh you know, obviously there's a lot of things that will answer a vocal, you know, you can do that on any instrument, but the pedal right. steel's main function was to be a foil to the vocals. And right. so in classic okay. country, when you get these incredible, unique musicians like George Jones or Willie Nelson, who do phrasing like you've never heard before, and right. they'll never do anything the same twice, well, you have to respond to that and match that and be a part of it. So it's 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 really a special deal. In the 70s and 80s, that element got kind of tossed away because pedal steel just sort of became, um, you know, another texture in the record. So you would have a vocal and maybe someone would slide up to a chord and you know right. that's all you would get. But in the 60s, you straight up had to be the best of the best of any right. and for me there's never been players that were better than that and um you know it is a pretty bold statement but i think those musicians were absolutely the best musicians of uh, any genre and any field any level uh it's a shame that a lot of it's not more documented because um you know technology being and also and also too is you know uh unless you're understand the, the classic country i think i don't think many of the newer country artists use the lap a lot many no. of i mean it's it that again it really fell by the wayside in the 80s i guess it was just because people don't want it you know oddly enough people don't want to sound too country um <laughs> you, and, know, you know check. that's 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 how we we used to differentiate between country and rock music you know is there was something in the country sound that you knew that it was country and in the rock sound you knew it was rock and nowadays 
I hear I hear some of the some of the country songs, and it it's almost like they're can't tell. you know cross you're crossing yeah. over to each other, and it's like, it like wait a, a second, yeah. or pop you know country pop you know it's like wait a second you know aren't you guys supposed to be country? I mean I know it's kind of uh, kind of labeling or being prejudiced to it, but it's like if I want to listen to country music, which I really don't. <laughs> If I want to listen to it, I want to listen to stuff in like in the 60s and the 70s. Yeah. After that, it just it got too mainstream. Right. You know, bands were they were trying to sound like. Well, again, the the genre takes over and you get so many people that are kind of pissing in the talent pool and you lose the feeling of the masters, the originators, you know. Exactly. And I and I guess that's that could be also the same in rock music. It's like oh, yeah. the, the rebellion of the 50s and 60s and 70s started, um, I mean, in the late 70s, early 80s, you, got, you had the punk. And so that, that was kind of a, that, you know, still stayed true to the originals, you know, in mm-hmm. the 50s. But after that, it just got too, Mm-hmm. clean and it's like wait a second rock and roll is supposed to be rebellious it's supposed to be a dirty you know mm-hmm. sound you know when you, you can have your little ballads and stuff like that but if you're going to do a rock song that that song is better rocked you know it has to rock you know in order to be a rock song or it's just or else it's just pop music you know i mean i'm not expecting someone that's doing um you know a, you know regular rock you know let's say maybe let's say a power pop band you know like you were saying you know red cross or something like that i'm not going to expect them to go full out heavy metal yeah you know you because know, that's they, not... they whip out some of the best kiss covers you're ever going to hear oh yeah that, oh what was that move you remember that movie that they were in, Spirit of 76? Spirit of 76, yeah. I'm like going, damn. I saw that years ago, and then I don't know what it was. Um, I think uh, another of our friends, Carrie. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Carrie's a big power popper. Yeah, he got me back into into that. I was kind of into it, and I, but I didn't know what the hell it was. I just thought it was just rock music. It was Carrie loves gay. There's another band, um, Carrie and I, when we met, we really bonded on a band from Denton, Texas called Adventures of Jet. Uh, and uh, he's the only person that I, I actually had a, 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 one of those weird things in life. I ended up with a small group of really good friends from, that went to school in Denton. And uh, Carrie's the only other person I've ever met outside of that group that knew this band, Adventures of Jet. They also had been a band called Bob Goblin, which I think they've gone back to that name, but they were incredible. There was so much great music coming out of Denton in the late yeah, 90s, he, early 2000s. Yeah, Harry's the one. If I ever want uh, Power Pop, he's my go-to guy for that, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, it's like, it's so cool to have people that are in different genres that you can say, that's my go-to person, you know? I can. I can ask them and say, what's a good thing of that? You know, and just, okay, yeah. I mean, I, I love, I love uh, when music is catchy, but not, not corny catchy, not trying to, not trying to be a mainstream catchy, but just a catchy right. would have that, that good, you know, that, the, uh, a good riff or, you know, good, or a good, uh, good vocals, you know, like a nice, chorus you know that you go yeah you know that it, they just energized and was it that that band you know like you say red cross is one of those bands oh so good it's another one of those bands that the one album that i really want is out of print so it's like prices are way sky high for the 80 fucking dollars for forget the name of the album but it has that um is it something's fantasy what are you talking about Red Cross? Yeah, that I don't oh, have it, but I'm, yeah, that yeah. one. 
that's that album is out of print. I don't know if it's. I'm hoping they'll come back in print because I, 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 you're not listening to vinyl, that. right? You're just talking about CDs. CDs, yeah. I I don't have the room for vinyl. Oh, no room, no room. Oh, yeah. If I had the room, I would have. Okay. If, if can you imagine all these things on vinyl? How much you can't find a cop? What is that? Um, I have them all digital, so I don't even think about what record they're on. Is that that's uh? Isn't that phase shifter or is yeah. that neurotic? Yeah, phase shifter is ninety dollars. I think it is. I think oh. I should, I would try to look for that, or maybe you know, it if is. the CD is over, if the CD is over thirty dollars, I'm sorry, you know, you're gonna you're gonna probably have to hand deliver it to me. <laughs> um, Chet's uh, Chet's uh, no market. Talking about pedal steel players here. He's giving props to Rusty Young from Poco, true originator that we just lost. Rest in peace. Uh, Buddy Cage, the great Buddy Cage, who took over for Jerry Garcia and New Riders, the Purple Sage. Also, unfortunately, we just lost him last year, I think. Rest in peace. Um, and then he's up on the Red Cross scene. I didn't, I'm not sure I knew Chet was a Red Cross fan, even though that does not surprise me. <laughs> My you never you never, you never know you know it's like you only that's the one thing is it's so funny it's like when people see you only uh listing you know your usual suspects and then all of a sudden you pull something out of the hat that you're not expecting and they go i didn't know you like that oh, you know yeah. it's, it's kind of it's kind of cool and that's that's where i draw a lot of um my recommendations it's from people on facebook mm -hmm. and you know during the pandemic there was a lot of people that were posting my favorite album oh i love this album this thing know. you know blew me away when I, and so when i see that and if i respect the, the person's opinion on things i then go over to youtube and check out the music there now, yep. you know, because it's like, okay, you told me you recommend this. Now I need to verify if it really is that good. Yeah. And it, and when it is really that good, I'm like, oh, that order yeah. it, you know. Do I got the money for it is the other question. But, you know, it's like, I got to order it. I mean, my um, my Amazon wish list for CDs, I think it's in the thousands right now. Oh, my God. I don't know if I'll ever get dent that, you know, because it, it keeps on. Every week, I keep on adding maybe a half dozen new new things that maybe, um, I mean, I got two categories of how, music. It's music that I listen to that I never um, upgraded to CD and, and the sets are gone, um, that category, or it, it completely, I was, it was under the radar for me, you know? Where it's like, oh, that band, I know people were mentioning it up in high school, but never got into them because in high school, I could care less about music. Yeah. You know, uh, I did listen, to, you know, then on my little Walkman, I had, I had uh, Queen 2, which I'll say, that's my go-to album for them. Mm. That's a good uh, record. Um, and I forgot what else I had, but all I had were cassettes at that time. And then when the CD came out, I was like going, okay, that's what I need because I'm getting tired of rewinding <laughs> or fast forwarding so I could get to the other side, you know. From yeah. So here's like, I could go direct. It's like um, the thing with records, I did have some growing up, I m maybe a couple dozen. Um, but I was always afraid to either smudge them, get them scratched on the by the needle, mm. or accidentally drop them because you know how you got to be. It's like you, you got to be really delicate with it, and I almost felt like I was like, oh, and you know, it's like. So I never. I mean, I, I love listening to people go and say, I got a new record lp you know vinyl i got vinyl i think that's so fantastic i mean we got the guys that like you know of our generation where that's in our 
kind of in our DNA in, in a way. And then you got these newer kids that um, new, are newer people, uh, the hipsters, you know, oh yeah, I gotta get vinyl. Why do you gotta get it? Wow, it's the coolest thing, it's trendy. Get it because you like it, you know? Don't mm -hmm. get it because everyone else says you gotta have it. Get it yeah. because that's what you want, you know? It's, it, it, it goes throughout any of those formats, music or movies, you know, it's like, get it because you want, you know, like I'm, I, I mean, now it's like, I just barely, you know, two or three years got into Blu-ray and now they got this 4K thing coming out. And it's like, what the hell, man? You know, it's like, you just released it on Blu-ray and then six months later, now it's on, you're releasing on 4K. You know, it's like, you know, let the Blu-ray market, you know, have its time. Just the same way as, you know, the VHS market had its time, the DVD market, it had not as much time as the VHS, but it had some time and it's like- Can't stop technology. I know. You know, we've taken that pill and it's just everybody wants to do as much. And you wants know- the, wants, wants the best of it and- yeah, but I I gotta tell you, you know, going into you know this is a different topic, but it it coincides with Prague, is that movie Suspiria, you know, done and the soundtrack by Goblin, yeah. this just de demonic Prague soundtrack. Oh my God, it sends Scary. chills yeah. chills up and down your spine. When they went to did it to Blu-ray, it's like color palette that you know Dario Argento used you could it was like watching the movie for the very first time yeah you don't get that that often you know and that goes with music you don't get that often where you listen to it and I gotta tell you of recent times the one that did it for me is right here uh Eddie Jobson Zinc uh the oh. green album Wow. They put it out uh, a double package with uh, his second one, Theme of Secrets, which is more new age. And then they have a Blu ray disc of it, the audio in 5.1, I believe it is. I listen to it on my headphones on my Blu ray player. It's like, it's like the thing completely jumped out and it was like it, it kind of almost you know it would surround so you know you had that three-dimensional feeling where you the music was like engulfing you and um are you getting a red alert up there there's this the, one of these things keeps on dropping down <laughs> I'll be back up. oh yeah it's, wanna, it's, you're getting transmission my, my bransonator it's telling me when richard branson gets too close <laughs> you know, blown out the, of the sky <laughs> i'm obviously on autopilot so i don't want to jump i don't want to run into them so uh you know that's, yeah, thing we, that's, that's the ship telling me it needs to just veer off a little bit so, right <laughs> yeah suspiria that, that, the all the all the new versions of suspiria have been so well done i think i think i saw the 4k in la oh yeah they would they did that um, right and i gotta say that was the best feeling i've ever had in a cinema ever um you know there were some scenes with the you know coupled with the goblin music uh i i will have a lifelong uh touchstone moment of feeling incredible all over body tingles of almost almost having the sensations be too much it was in the section right in the beginning when she's in the car and she sees over in the forest that stuff's going on and and the main goblin theme is playing and there's the quick editing it actually was almost a little too intense for me it was like sensory overload it was perfect oh yeah the and, and, the, and the music were so coupled up well and, and then was, and then when the when the that the, the vocalization of that yeah i'm like Oh my god! Right in the right in the back of the neck, the hairs were like that, and I'm like, oh. and I saw this movie way before I knew what Prague was. 
but I just love how the music was and the movie. It was like they, they were a perfect marriage. Yeah. I mean, the the movie was a little kind of like it was trippy. You know, you you weren't. I mean, you had to read into it, and you know, and with definitely yeah, takes some it, weird turns. Yeah, and I'm like going, holy crap! And it's like, but. I think what it was is with with Dario Gento, it wasn't the story that was the importance. Yeah. It was the, vis, the visuals. Yeah. You he know, wanted you to all, feel all those my vibrant. Favorite, my favorite scene of any movie of all time is in that. And, um, you know, uh, uh, sorry for the three people watching if it's a spoiler, but uh, it's not a spoiler for the whole movie, but it's uh, uh, the scene when the, the woman's getting chased and uh she's trying to escape the killer and she finds a door and she thinks she's entering a safe room you know where she's oh my god i've gotten away from this killer and what she's done is walked into a room full of barbed wire oh i know oh why my is god. there a room full of barbed wire who has that who just room. has a room full of barbed wire and you a dance what? studio of no but it's like the most incredible scene and i just love it to death yeah um, and it's like you know those those are the kind of thing and it's like no, you know it's just, it was like you know the, the music yeah the music i mean and i got into the goblin music back then i didn't know what the hell they were i just thought right. it was just interesting kind of music this was uh when i was working at a video store in the mid 80s well, I, I, you know, I rented as much as I humanly possibly could because I had no wife, you know, so it's like, you know, uh, I think it was 86, so I was 20 years old. I had really no wife, so I ended up going, okay, I just rent as many of these things as I can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're really yeah. into, I mean, that's the uh, the, the other, <laughs> I know, chat, right? I know. Who has a room full of barbed wire? What the fuck? Um, <laughs> uh, but you're uh, you're really into Giallo and... Um, oh, yeah, I love, I love that. I mean, and there's, and, and just the same as with music, it's like you go down a rabbit hole because you find newer yeah. stuff, and it's like, you know, stuff that, you know, in the American market, you know, you wouldn't know of these things. Yeah. You'd have to be really, you know, a film aficionado to know a lot of these Italian uh, or even the Euro uh, horror, horror stuff that they did utilize a lot of goblin music. Goblin, yeah. And then all the great Fulci stuff. Yeah, what's his name? Uh, the keyboardist uh, Fabio Fritzi. You know yeah. this guy. Oh my God! It's like oh my God. It was like they were. I swear to God, it felt like those two artists were like conjuring it up hell. Yeah. I mean, they were yeah, because yeah. they had these demonic sounds. Oh. The, uh, without going, you know, like into the the metal sound, they had these demonic sounds that it's like. I think they would have put a lot of these metal bands that claim to be uh, that they worship the devil. I think it would probably scare the crap out of them because you're, oh, you know, you're getting yeah. And yeah. it's like, but it, is, you know, I can't remember. I think we've talked about it before, but you know, one of my favorite CDs in the world is um, Mort Macabre. Uh, oh, Mort Macabre, yeah, yeah. The the combination between Anecdote and, and Landsberg, where they cover horror themes, and they do, uh, I think they do a song from the Beyond, and yeah. uh, and then they do the killer uh, Rosemary's Baby. But, you yeah, know, one of my that. favorite things that I've been blessed with in life getting to see is, um, you know, at one of the uh, you know, there's a there's a horror fantasy festival that happens here in LA at the Egyptian Theater every year called uh, Beyond Fest, and they hosted Goblin in a live performance. And one, I'm I might be getting uh, memories mixed up, but I think they've had them twice. I might have that wrong. Oh no 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 they 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 this is what it was. Uh, they had Goblin out and 
and uh, Goblin played live at the Egyptian Theater, which was a, is an old historic theater here in LA. Oh, yeah. And they played with a reel of of great Argento movies behind them. Behind, and yeah. Four K screening of Suspiria proper, and then um, and I have the best. Let me. I'm gonna get this off of my wall. My two two of my favorite possessions are actually posters that I got. Trying not to break this. Let's see if we can. Look at that. Oh, wow. Goblin, the Egyptian. And you know, I've had this poster for a long time, for a bunch of years. And I just the other day, it freaked the hell out of me because, like, okay, this chick is holding the knife. And then I just realized that her eyes are reflected in the knife. It's like, such yeah, a no, that, well done poster. So, one thing is like, he. He was so artistic with how each frame of his movies were. And I got this one too. It's really fun. Oh yeah. Yeah. That that keyboard's green. Oh yeah. <laughs> so it's in space now. <laughs> I'm in space. You can't see green. That's a that's a little known fact. In space, green doesn't exist. Um uh, Had to, had to wash my hands because I haven't been cleaning in a while. Yeah, I love that's a real fun, that's a real fun uh, juxtaposition there, you know, getting, I mean, you know, all of that Italian, even the lesser known stuff, you know, I, I, there's a really, you would actually really enjoy this group. I have these friends that do movie nights here in LA called Rendezvous. And um, they have a film club on, it's on Facebook. And then they're also all over Instagram. And, um, you know, they, they stopped doing it. I think they might be coming back with it. But, you, you know, like, well, pre-COVID, every, the first Friday, the, I'm sorry, the second Friday of every month, we would actually get together at a bar in uh, Silver Lake. And they would screen all these, all this weird shit. Lots of Jess Franco. Are you into Jess Franco? Yes, I, I've seen some of his. He's I mean, sort not of, as much. He's a Spanish or Mexican Mexican director, I think. And, no, from uh, Spain. From Spain. Spain. And um, you know, also just out there, you know, sort of low budge horror, great stuff. And but all his soundtracks are like super, you know, progged and fusion funk stuff. You know, and that's, oh, yeah. a, that's a real fun thing. Um, <laughs> greeting doesn't exist. I said green, green doesn't exist in space. You, you can't wear green. It's really weird. Um, something about the, the orbital pull that just sucks green right out. You can't wear it. Um, no. But yeah, you know, it's just so so much I, I just love that marriage of of the the two medias yeah you know where you know and pro prog bands can easily do sound or soundtracks oh yeah because you know especially if they're they're very fantastical or you know they you know it's perfect because then they can just go off on a tangent, you know, in any kind of direction is how they want to go. And so it's like, I mean, I know, I know a lot of people, they don't like, you know, progressive rock because it's intricate and everything that, you know, and it's like, I think in today's society, we're so one dimensional on mm -hmm. how we listen to music, how we watch movies i mean music has got to be straightforward you know and movies have to because if you notice that a lot of movies are getting dumber and dumber well I mean, they're, just, they're just reutilizing like, I, don't, I don't pay attention to that like if well if, they're just like, they're just reutilizing formulas you know and not doing new things you know yeah. and it's just I have, the same I have zero interest in the blockbuster world 
zero. No, that that didn't get me to any of it. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I like some of I like some of the movies that come out. Yeah, but if it you know not, I don't really care how much movie makes. Uh, all I care about is is it good or bad? Yeah, and to me, you know, that's not. I don't David, judge it. David Lynch is about as mainstream as I get. You know, I I watch. I like David Lynch. I like Lars von Trier. Um, you know, uh, and then I I like the the old '70s stuff that we're talking about. You know, um. Summer of Chet just brought up Summer of Soul. Summer of Soul is probably the best documentary that's ever been done. It's just incredible. Um, but again, what's it talking about? You know, it's talking about 1968. You know, so. Oh yeah, you know, it's like the Grateful Dead documentary, Long Strange Trip, was really good. That's a good documentary. But again, it's about the dead through that that period. I watch mostly documentaries. I've I've gone to a really weird phase in my life. Now you have to realize that from the time I started to get into music, which was when I was four or five years old, um, all I did was hammer down as much music as I could get into my system, probably oh, yeah. until my early 40s. And um, especially, you know, once my schedule with the pandemic started to blow up and, and also just I, I keep pretty busy all the time anyway. I mean, like I I was just realizing I, I, I have I I don't get bored. You know, I have too many things that I'm working on all the time. Ever, I really don't listen to music anymore. Like I almost never just put anything on for fun. Very very rarely, and when I do, it's a dead show. Like you know, there's a there's an app website called Relisten that actually has every Grateful Dead show that's ever been recorded on it. Right you know, that you can just go listen to for free, organized by year, by month, by show. It's incredible. So, you know, if I have to like go take a shower, um, you know, it, I do it, uh, you know, I put on re-listen and, and listen to a dead show. So, you know, it's weird. Oh, and also in my car, I do have a cassette deck and a CD player. So, uh, you know, I'll buy a Grateful Dead CD for like a dollar used or on clearance, and then I'll have music for the car. And that's all I listen to anymore. I never put on any bands ever. And then I really never watch any movies ever, except for, you know, some of this weird 70s art house stuff. Um, right. You know, yeah, I put, I put a, lot of my, a lot of my music on this, put it in my car, the, the thumb drive. Oh, yeah. Because I don't, you know, like I say a lot of time, I don't want to carry like 10 CDs into my car. And, and then when I get out of the car, you know, going going somewhere to hide them, you know, like put my jacket on top of it so people don't break into my car to get the CDs. And I'll be able to look at the CDs and go, oh, no, I'll pass. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I listen to it that way. I, I do like to listen to it as much new music as I can. A lot of it I discover through friends, and a lot of it I I discover it through how they, you know, the, that old, you know, algorithm. If you like this band, you're gonna love these bands, you know, that kind of thing. So I'm like going, okay, yeah. well, let me see why they why they told me I'm gonna love these bands, and I'd say eight or nine out of ten times they're they're right. Mm. You know, they it just music that just grabs me. You know, just about almost any of the rock genres. You know, it grabs me anywhere from the pop up to metal. And metal nowadays for me, I have to. I'm very selective of, on because I want something where it doesn't sound. Some of the newer stuff sounds very programmed. Oh yeah. Yeah. And you know, it sounds too clean, too right. perfect. Right. You know, again, we're going back to that thing that you know, rock and roll's got to be dirty. Mm -hmm. In essence, metal's got to be dirty. You know, mm -hmm. got to be dirtier. You know, <laughs> you know, it's it's got to have that that grit to it. That you know, if you're gonna, if your music is gonna be uh, polished, then 
you know, stay within the pop genre. But if you're going to call yourself a rock band, you know, you got to rock. You know? um, yeah. Not a rock. You know, it's like, it's not a, it's, it's, then it's false advertising. If you say, I'm a rock and roll band, you come out with all these sappy songs. It's like, no, you're not. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, I, I look forward to seeing what what else, you know, Astral Arc is going to do. Me too, yeah. I, I really, you know, I think you touched upon something that we haven't seen in a long time that people are kind of overlooking, you know, again, we're going back to, you know, I like your wording going back to the blueprint. You're going back to the blueprint. You're, you're, you're in a way kind of like starting from scratch, you know, you know, you're, you're, it's almost like you're saying, okay, well, I'm kind of forgetting everything that came in the mid seventies to now, you know, so yeah. I want to, you know, you want to focus on where those bands got their, their influence, you know, their, you know, that's the, the, the little uh, light bulb moment saying, hey, you know, I'm going to go down this route, you know, you know, you want to go back to that. And I think that's fantastic. Well, that's just my favorite, you know, like the, the genre that I just feel like I really get, you know, that just I really fall in line with is that sense of um, experimental sound sculpting that, you know, like all these psychedelic trippy bands have. Oh, yeah. You in, know, in, in the late 60s. I mean, to me, I just, you know, I, I, I mean, you know, people forget how true, you know, when, you know, a lot of people, you know, even when they reflect back on like, oh, what's your Pink Floyd experience or something, you know, and it's usually Dark Side or The Wall. Well, for me, it's Piper at the Gates of Dawn, you know, right. and when people talk about think, the dead, they think about, oh, what the dead were like in the 90s and the 80s, mostly. And for me, it's Live Dead, it's Oxymuxoa, you know, it's like, I want that trippy, psychedelic, world you know i like the right. beatles when they were doing drugs you know i like the zombies <laughs> when they were emulating the beatles doing drugs you know uh oh yeah you know it's like i i think it's um you know you're going back you know like you say with pink boy for me or i do like stuff after metal yeah but i love stuff that's before metal yeah for sure i mean it just it I mean, for me, you know, since I don't take drugs, I don't do any of that, you know, I, I don't got any quorums with people that do, you know, that mm -hmm. everybody, it's up to everybody as what they want to do. Uh, but those, that kind of stuff, trippy, like, uh, that one time, first time I heard Interstellar Overdrive on the headset, when it was panning all over the place, I got... The first time I got dizzy, but I, it was like I got dizzy, but I was with a smile on my face, you know, yeah. that, that kind of thing. And it was like it just took me to another dim dimension of, you know, of places that I didn't think I could go to. Do you know, you know do you know Dukes of Stratosphere? I know of them, but I have not heard them. Essential. You know, I know Carrie has been talking about those guys. I mean, if you like, Are, they're basically what they're they're ecstasy, but they just because they wanted to do a different sound, they didn't want to, I guess, confuse the their. That's a, that's exactly. They wanted to do. They were writing songs, and they, and, you know, it's interesting because those albums that they're around, you know, Skylarking and Oranges and Lemons are like my. That's my favorite XTC. And yeah. they were yeah. they were writing stuff that was just too genre specific and too over the top to go on their regular records. So they created the Dukes of Stratosphere, right? You know, name and and they're amazing because I mean, when do you get you know this is in the eighties? You know, you get yeah. a band that had John Leckie producing them and and a budget. And they went into real major deal studios and got to craft two incredible documents that are, you know, psychedelic rock. You know, like they, they when it was not hip to go play 
60s revivalist music you know this right is right you know you're talking madonna and you know prince and that you know 80s and mtv and here's a major successful band that just went in and used their clout and their record label and their great producer and money to make two psychedelic 60s rock records right unheard of you know incredible i i, mean, I, I love i love the band. LA, but they were all unknown at the time i love the I love when bands kind of throw you off like that because then they're showing that okay we're we're artistic we're not just we're not just on a what do you call it um, we're not on cruise control doing the same things every album every album we want to bring one one band I gotta tell you that I was so surprised I mean we know Oingo Boingo this happy dance music stuff. But when they put out that one album, Boingo, that dark sounding, it sounded like, um, in some ways, it sounded like an evil Beatles, you know, because at that time, Danny Elfman was in the soundtrack. So it had that kind of a soundtrack vibe to it, but it was so dark sounding. I think they even did. Uh, um, Beatles songs, uh, I Am the Walrus, or one of those songs, and it was just so dark sounding. And it was like, I never thought when I heard this, and it had a, had a kind of a prog vibe without it actually being full on progressive rock. Yeah. It had a vibe there. And I'm like, going, I didn't think, I mean, there was like, eight minute songs, 10 minute song. And it's like, oh, wow. Boys, you know, it's like, it was like completely off field. But instead of them being Oingo Boingo, they dropped, they call themselves Boingo. And huh. it, was just, it was just that. For maybe again, for that obvious reason that, you know, with XTC doing the Dukes of Stratus, you know, we don't want them to get confused, you know. Yeah. But I sometimes I like to. You know, I want someone, especially if they go in a direct, a uh, really good direction and something that, you know, you, you connect to, yeah. you know, so it's like, I, I, I just, that's just, I think that shows that a musician is creative beyond what, you know, that a little poor room box you know, genre that they're in, you know, that's why, you know, like with Led Zeppelin, all those, they weren't always just straight ahead of rock. They had other things going on. Folk, oh, yeah. You know, reggae, you know, totally. funk, you know, they had all these different things going on, but you knew that it was Led Zeppelin. You knew that they were not going to be confined to those four walls. So to speak. Right. And but you don't get those bands now. You know, people miss the point. You know, they think, oh, Led Zeppelin's heavy metal, so you have to play it as heavy and hard and fast and and overdrive as possible. When that is not what Led Zeppelin was about. If you really pick those parts, if you pick all those parts to get apart, John Bonham did not play very hard. Uh, you know, you hear the tone of his drum set. He played. Uh, he played pretty light, you know, to be honest, you know, and that let him do what he did and sound so good and play so fast. And then also his whole, all his influences were James Brown and the meters and uh, funk, you know, he wasn't trying to out rock people. It's just, you know, he had such a great bunch of influences. That's what it was. And then Jimmy Page, you know, people are always like, I got to have eight Marshall stacks and the stuff, you know, cause that's what they, think about when they think of Jimmy Page and they think about seeing him live with the Les Paul when those first two records were him playing a Telecaster into an eight inch guitar amp. He had a Supro that was an eight inch speaker. That's that right. crushing sound. You take a small amp and you turn it up all the way and you mic it and you double track it and it's the biggest guitar sound in the world. And right. you know, so people miss the point with Zeppelin a lot. I also got to say, I've, I've gotten to meet Steve Bartek from Oingo Boingo a few times, and we actually played Dukes of Stratosphere music together at a tribute um, oh, to cool. FTC. 
and it's just it's one of the nicest memories I have from music is like me on stage playing XTC music and Dukes of Stratosphere music with with Steve Bartek. He's such a great guy and that's, still that's just amazing talent and very busy here in LA. Oh yeah, that, it's just so amazing. I mean, there's so much out there, you know, yeah. and where I didn't have the patience to learn an instrument. I think it's kind of my job to kind of absorb as much music as I possibly can. I mean, I'm not, I, uh, you know, I think for every 10 albums I get recommended, I only get one or two only because of, you know, financial reasons. Yeah. If I had the, the means, oh my goodness, I think this, this whole um, little room would be a lot of this, <laughs> you know, and and I get a lot of people that at, when I have pictures of this up there, you listen to all that. I said, well, obviously not all at once, <laughs> you know, but I do listen to it. You know, there is days when I want to listen to, you know, I got right up here, Blue Oyster Cult, you know, yeah. other days I want to over here, I got. Judas Priest, you know, Budgie, Def Leppard, Chicago, mm -hmm. Giraffe, Queen, Frost, Bruford, uh, Demonia, which is uh, basically the he heavier version of Goblin. Oh. Um, Rocket Scientist, local hair guys. Mm -hmm. Iron Maiden up there, you know, Genesis, you know, I got, you know, the box set. So it just, the boxes the rest down there mm. i mean it'll probably take me like months and months to talk about every single cd i got because mm -hmm. you know uh i listen to it all and it's all depending on my mood is what I mm. I, and i really think that that's what music should be it shouldn't be just saying i don't want to listen to heavy metal or i don't want to listen to right you know you should have a, a healthy diet of everything and honestly to hell with what other people say, think sure. you like it because it touches you, you know, just because you know your friends don't like it doesn't mean you have to follow what they say and i used to do that i used to follow what other people said now it's like i don't care i don't you know you know they always say what's your guilty pleasure i don't have that because none of what i listen to do I feel guilty listening? Right. You know, and you shouldn't because music is, is a, I think music is a personal thing for everybody. Yeah. You get something like, you know, for yourself. I mean, you, you know, with the Grateful Dead, I mean, that, that is something that personally, you know, and, and to hell with other people that they say, ah, oh, I don't like that. You know, it's like, well, hey, that's your right, but I like them. So, you know, respect that, you know, so yeah. you got to respect everybody's uh, musical tastes, you know, even if you don't like it, you know, you think it's, oh, you know, no, you know, that I used to, that used to be uh, the vocabulary that I was around and how I, how I chose my music based on whether or not it sucks, because someone else said it, you know, and I'm uh, like, now it's like if someone said it sucks, okay, I gotta I gotta find out why they said that. You know, did they say it because they got they personally didn't like it or or it was the truth? Yeah. I was like, you know, you gotta you gotta respect everybody's music taste because everybody it's gonna be different. Yeah. You know, our generations, we have so much. You know, I really feel bad for the the, the teenagers that are growing up now, they don't have much of a variety of stuff because everything sounds the same. Yeah, well, you know, you know, you know I mean, there's some... The side of that is if they have good adults in their life, you know, then you can yeah, steer I them mean, into stuff and then they have everything at their disposal. I mean, you know, I'll meet, I'll meet the hippest 14 or 15 year olds that you know, could school me on Velvet Underground, and I'm just like, what the oh, fuck? Yeah, the, you know, it, it's few and far between, but the you know the kids are out oh, yeah, there. Yeah. You know, there are a lot of kids. I've I've had the 
the great benefit to uh uh you know really get into knowing some school of rock people and uh you know on woodstock there was the paul green uh paul green yeah yeah you know, what's he call it uh his rock camp thing and you know it's great oh, yeah. kids that you know he had he had a bunch of kids that would go play you know in germany every year at the big zappa convention you know and this is these are 14 15 year old 16 year old kids oh, yeah. going to play zappa you know it's incredible they just got they just got good good parents because it, it's it's so funny you know when i look at myself at 55 and i try, and i try to remember my dad at 55 um it was like church it's like i'm nowhere near what my dad was i mean i'm just still i'm still that 18 year old kid you know, know. deep down that's all i am and every once in a while i kind of get reality checks but you know that's how it is when you get old but my but my mind is of that 18 year old and that's how i pick my pick my music you know that's what I, fresh I mean, I can listen to a more melodic uh, Neil Young stuff in one instant, and then the next thing I could be listening to Slayer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like yeah. it's all it's all based on you know moods, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think the more styles, the better. Yeah, because then you can have more you know, have more room to stretch out your moods, you know. Like when I got that weather report, uh, black market, I'm like, this is so cool. You know, something like, okay, for everybody else, they've had had it for years and decades. Me, I just got it. It's fresh into me, you know, so I'm, I'm diving into that genre a little bit more than it maybe five, 10 years ago, because it wasn't on my radar of things, even though people are left and right saying this is this is you know this yeah. is the thing you know you got to get this you got to get that. Ah, eventually yeah. well i i have it and i mean there's just so much out there you know decades and decades and decades of great stuff oh yeah i'm always blown every year there's someone who comes in and it's like whoa that's something i never thought about getting into it and then it changes my life you know like oh yeah every year that's, that's so, the one thing you know you gotta be open-minded you know but you try. are more well versed in a lot of stuff than most people are and so you have to appreciate that about your I, you know i um i i do that because and, and one of the one things i love to do is i love to watch documentaries on music like what chet was saying about the different documentaries mm. and i got gotten into the ones that he was mentioning you know but I got into some some of them I watch on YouTube that people have uploaded there and you know find out so many different different things that you that weren't as publicly known. Mm -hmm. Uh maybe within the community it is known, but it's like for the for the most part, you know, they don't know. And mm -hmm. just to find out uh different stuff. So it's like I one of my other practices I do when I get a CD, I immediately go since we've got the power of the internet. I immediately go look and type in the name of the band, mm -hmm. and then look for you know most either their website, but their website tends to be more biased to them. So I like to look at the Wikipedia, Wikipedia and then you can yeah. find you can find you know because then everybody is is posting in there. No one's biased to you know, they're, if anything, they're only biased to their experience with the band, but mm -hmm. you get all this, you know, for the most part, you get a lot of truthful information. Yeah. You know, but you learn, I gotta, you know, to me, I like to learn about what, why did that guy do use that instrument that is totally non-conventional? Why did he do that? You know things like that you know i i want to know you know it's like i got it's not i want to i have to i have to know why you know just like when you when i was saw about your you know pedal steel 
I wanted to know more about because all I used to associate that was with country music, but some rock bands have used them in the 70s. So it's like, I want, you know, I like to know why is it used and and why does it sound so cool? <laughs> you know, you know, that's just, just how I am. I just like, you know, I need, I have a thirst for knowledge, you know, you know, I just don't want to buy the CD, listen to the CD, you know, and if it's heavy, you know, rock it out and then turn it off and go about the day. I need to know why was that album made, you know, that's an important thing for me so that I can better understand when I'm listening to music. And a lot of mainstream people don't do that because they just, you know, because a lot of nowadays, there's nothing to it. Yeah. You know, people are just punching buttons on their on their keyboards and then singing and then have auto-tune fix their voice and and if they're not pretty enough they get some model to lip sync <laughs> yeah what's the music. Than hearing stories about oh we were black sabbath and we rented a mansion and moved our recording studio and rick wakeman came over and we got drunk and he did some overdubs and then john bonham came over and we jammed for five hours but that never came out or got recorded somehow. And then we made the best record ever. You know, you just don't get stories like that anymore. No, no. It's just so, that's so cool. You know, you know, so many stories. I mean, and so much knowledge that needs to be learned that it's not just music. It's how the music was created. Yeah. That's why, that's why it's so cool. Uh, you know, it's, for me, it makes, um, I gotta be honest, my girlfriend's the opposite. She can care less. <laughs> as long as it sounds good, that's all she cares about. And that's cool. That's cool too. You know, that's um, the music is everybody differently. Everybody wants yeah. everybody comes in with their own entry point. And you know, I don't understand that very well. I mean, to but I know I see it happen. I, I have a great friend who has a wife who only listens to what's on uh you know pop radio you know and and uh and she has no interest in going out and buying cds or going to concerts and or you know and i i don't understand that because that's my entire life is like i want to, i want to find a band that i love and buy everything that they've ever done and then see them every time they're in town you know that's exactly. that's how i do things you know and uh and so I don't really understand anybody that doesn't do anything else, but, you know, and then there's bands that are the other person I don't really get is, you know, like uh, the person that goes to a show and then wants to go, uh, you know, a lot of people will go to a concert and then they'll go, oh, and, and this is great. This is a nice thing, but they'll go and, you know, maybe go outside away from the show and dance or smoke or hang out with people. And it's like, you came to see the show, watch the show, you know? So like, when exactly. I, to concert, I like to get as close. Well, you got the people that are holding up their cameras. Well, I don't mind that because I mean, yeah, I have a horrible memory, you know, like I had a brain injury in my twenties and uh, right. you know, things aren't all there. And so uh, I like to go to concerts and I like to videotape things. It's important to me. It's part well, of there's, my You know, there's, there's that, but then there's people that, especially nowadays that, they're not doing it for that reason. They're doing it for a documentation. They're doing it because now they can say, I was there and I have yeah. proof, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. can you remember the show? No, not really. Yeah, because you were spending too much time with the camera, kind of, you know, and doing your little selfies, right. stuff like I don't that. Have any problem with that. I think that's great. I don't and I, you know, it's like, to me, it's like, watch the show. Yeah. If you're going to record it, you know, audio, do it how they did it in our day. Oh, they got tape recorders stuck down their pants or wearing uh, an overcoat or something. The best um, is that guy from Providence that um, I can't remember his name, but, uh, uh, you know, if Matt Brown watches this, he can put it in the comments. But uh, there was a guy on the East Coast that would get into shows in a wheelchair. And he had his whole, he had like a Nakamichi tape deck under the wheelchair. Right. And so he would get into concerts, but his tape deck would be in the bottom of the thing and then he'd mic it. And all of his boots are 
the best bootlegs like he has a killer <laughs> if you if you go you know you can google it and come up with the things but like he has you know yes from like i want to say relayer or topographic like incredible incredible in, oh uh, no later i think maybe maybe like going for the one era um right. providence rhode island bootlegs uh, you know, he has a ki killer yes, the best Sabbath recording I've ever heard them live oh, with wow. Ozzy, like 75. Like he was in that, that the, the meat of that his time was like 74 to the maybe right. 77. And he just got all the great bands. But, but what's cool, yeah, like you're saying with the being in the wheelchair, he wasn't fiddling, he was pressing, probably press a button once and he was glued on to the, to the show. It wasn't like fiddling oh, yeah. and distracting himself. I think right. that's what I'm I'm more against is you're distracting yourself. Well then why don't you instead of going to these things, if they put out a, a DVD or a Blu-ray of it, then you could watch it and then you could, you know, pause it and go out for a smoke and talk to people, you know, or whatnot, you know, and or use it as your background, you know, then you know it's Concerts are made to be watched, not, you know, I mean, you have people that bootleg them. That's another story, you know, because they're, they know what they're doing. They're not distracting themselves from the watching or enjoying the show. They have set up where, you know, but the people that hold up the cameras, it's like, it's my thing is I, I just don't like it because what about the people in the back? Now they see this person with the camera right yeah. in front. And I want to see, I want to see that band. You know, I don't want to see your camera. Well, you know, you know, you know hopefully I, something respectful. I think, I think a lot of, you, can you do know, it respectfully. Yeah. A lot of it is, you know, nowadays it's, everybody's got to document where they've been so they can say, Hey, I've been here. You know, I got to do a selfie. You know, I got to do this. And it's like, and instead of living life, they're documenting life, and it's like we we can't all be document documentarians yeah. or whatever, you know. We got you got to live your life, you know. It's like, and you know, you may or may not remember what what you did 10, 15 years down the line. You know, it happens, but if you get those little bits of memories, those are I think they're special, you know, because you know you were living you were living life at that time. You know, and that's what you gotta, that's the main, I think that's the main thing about going to a concert. You're living your life, you're enjoying what you're seeing right now. You know, hope, you know, it's like, and then hope, hope your your favorite band that you got to see, they'll put, put out from that that tour. Like, I, I'm, I'm kind of sure that King Crimson is probably gonna, be, is, is being recording all their shows, gonna record all their shows because, that's this, I think thing. this, I think this tour is going to be a very important tour because coming out of the, that nasty pandemic, and uh, I think it, it's it's kind of a, a test in which uh, you know Robert Fripp loves to do these you know improv things, and uh, I think this is in a way, at least my opinion, in a way is kind of this concert series that he's doing it's kind of like a uh, a full-blown improv because not really sure where everything's going to be going after this you know so i think it will be documented you know by someone professional and i hope so because i would love to see what they have what they do you know this it should be I, I want to hope, you know, I'm I'm kind of maybe blowing out of proportion, but I'm hoping it's going to be something uh, historic. I'm sorry, what? Historical. I think it's, oh, I, hope, yeah. I hope it's going to be something historical where people are going to look back 20 years from now and say, hey, you know, remember when Crimson did these shows right out of that pandemic? And, you know, they were so great. They did yeah. new you know, a new way of thinking. I mean, it's like, for goodness sake, 
Robert Fripp's got a mohawk. I mean, it's not a big one, but he's got a mohawk. Yeah, he's got a mohawk. Yeah. And all those 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 uh, shows that he did with his wife. Oh my God. Yeah. My girlfriend loved watching them two together. She said, "That's not your your typical." Uh, uh, six, well, she, she, I think her way to Tori, it's mid 60s, he's 72. It's like, does you know, I remember, you know, when my grandparents were that age and they did not act free spirited. And here's this your woman. Grandma wasn't flashing your mohawk grandpa. Yeah, I'm like, going, oh, holy That's shit. Her. I mean, and, and she's vocally, she's still, she sounds good. I listen to old stuff of hers. Uh, she moves like she's in her 20s and 30s. Yeah. She's and it's out. like, holy crap. And, you know, and so, so in shape and him, I mean, it's got, I think he's got more of a sense of humor now than he did 10, 15 years ago. Oh, ever, ever. I mean, I mean, the, come on. I mean, he was, he was like this, you know, I used to look at him and he looked like a, like an English professor. Exactly, and now it's like he's he loosened up and he's you know live, you know he's living life, and I think that that's gonna affect how he plays and his mindset of yeah. The, you know, I really wish to do it. As a diehard King Crimson fan who's been into them since I possibly really early as could be, you know, which was the mid '80s for me. You know, I didn't get to see them in the '70s. But I've seen all the footage. I have a lot of records, a lot of boots, a lot of everything from the 70s and 60s. Um, uh, uh, I think I've seen almost all of the footage that's out there that you can see from King Crimson. Uh, I think there's on record pre-pandemic uh, only one instance of Robert Fripp smiling. I think, I think if you look back for, through footage, you will only see him smile once. And that was when King Crimson was on the TV show Fridays. And I remember that. Yeah, I think it's 82 or 83, like whenever. No, I think it was 80. Yeah, playing, somewhere on there. Yeah, they're playing discipline music. And that there's this hilarious scene where Robert's very Robert, you know, he's in his suit. And um, all of a sudden there's a pan and the camera zooms in on him. Like it starts out and it zooms in. And he's just got the weirdest grin and he's grinning and he's looking right at the camera. And it's, it's, it's actually disturbing. It's a little weird. But, um, <laughs> that's the only film footage I've ever seen Robert Fripp smile in until the pandemic. And it's so crazy. He's just so great. I love him, love him to death. Oh yeah. It's... We've got footage of Robert Fripp dancing in a bee suit. You know, that's, it doesn't, it doesn't, <laughs> that you know i know that that is when i saw that i was like going oh my god here's mr awesome. it's like is here's mr stiff lip and here he's he's just letting it loose letting it loose you know and you know i think it took that pan, the pandemic to actually loosen them up yeah you know? and toya they're just so wonderful which by the way oh, yeah. you know the movie uh erg a uh, music war I saw it years and years and years. Okay. I highly recommend that for people because it's got a, a very young Toya in it, um, XTC, uh, Oingo Boingo, very early Oingo Boingo, um, X, you know, some really phenomenal music performances oh, yeah. in that. Oh, yeah. That, that's really fun. It's so amazing. All yeah. that that wonderful music. music. Have you seen the Bruford Goes to College concert? Is that the National Lampoon thing? Yes. There's where they, they did that uh, with, with mocked. Walter. mocked uh, yeah, but it's a whole rock. concert. Yeah. No, I didn't see that, but I've I seen oh. I've heard the record. Oh, I heard yeah, the record on on, it on, YouTube. on YouTube. It's been it's been remastered um, and uh, and retouched. Uh, so the, it's, uh, Bruford Rock goes to college and, uh, it's a whole, I think it's a 60 minute show with the Jeff Berlin, Alan Holdsworth, Dave Swart band. 
so great. Yeah, because I, re I remember one, it was a National Lampoon thing. They kind of mimicked a, a frog song to the point, I mean, they were not mimicked. It was almost like uh, obviously a lampoon of it. And, oh, that's uh, not what I'm talking about. Then. Oh, okay. Got... That's something different. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, this yeah. is a Bruford concert that uh, had been recorded, in, you know, in Britain. I have the, the the live CD of it, and I think it's in the oh, box. Oh, that's in the box. Killer. I think it's in the box, you know. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. But, yeah. It's like the video for it. Yeah, that's the thing. I'll, I'll look for the video. Yeah. You know, but. Hey, you know, I just noticed how we, we surpassed our first time. We did Woo! we did uh, two hours, 45 minutes. Now we're two hours, 50 minutes. <laughs> there you go. Hey, you know, when you're having fun, you know, and talking about music, you know, you can't really um, limit yourself. I, I mean, know. there's some, I mean, it's just so much fun. It's a discussion, you know, it's a conversation. When, you know, and, and we and we go to different places. We don't I don't like I don't like traditional interviews. I really don't. I mean, because you don't get the information out of them. Right. You know, because they're I think people are more on on guard when you answer ask them questions and then how many you know, especially how many times uh does a band or an artist get asked, what's your influences? Who's your heroes? Uh, mm -hmm. What's your favorite record of the day? You know, what's your favorite record growing up? You know, things like that, you know, you're on guard, so you're only going to answer that thing. But this way, you know, you get to learn. Yeah. Get to learn more, 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 you know. Yeah. It's just like, cool. you know, I, I, I love doing it this way. It's, it's more fun. I get, Oh, it's always great to chat with you, you know. It's, oh yeah, you know, you I wish we were closer. And uh, this is the guy. It if you need a pedal steel in your in your music, this is the guy. Yeah. This is this is the guy. You know, he'll he'll give you top notch sounds and you'll you won't regret it. Man. I think that's I my think that's get, my plug. That's my plug. You're get some of my pedal steel on a uh genesis tribute next year oh cool yeah uh because you know dave kersner he's putting out a uh genesis tribute record uh with a bunch of great artists and um i am playing with fernando perdomo and i'm playing pedal steel on two tracks for him uh which was very interesting i'm actually aping some tony banks piano parts or organ parts uh, i did them on pedal steel and then um cool. i i don't know if i'm gonna make the final cut but then i actually got to record a track for that myself um oh. so uh which i do with matt brown and uh our other good friend matt hedrick uh who's in uh, genesis tribute out there on the east coast oh i can't remember their name oh, i'm sorry uh, but um they're they work out of out of virginia I, I might have all of these facts wrong um but um but that should do it well i should actually mosey do you want to hit anything else before we end now that we've broken our record i can leave yeah uh, you know and then that'll give us room you know the next time we talk we can hit an even three hours and we'll break this record yeah there we go yeah um well you know like i i said before i, I look forward to more astral art and anything else you know if if it doesn't fit that you know if you have something else going on and and then of course you know your your friday freak outs you know those are yeah. i gotta say that those gotta they go back towards those the 60s and 70s because you got things you know things going on behind you like like those old uh projector shows that they use they would well I, I love that so i have actually looked up trying to find you know gel light show art on the internet and you know found some really neat recreations that people have done and i so i sourced out that stuff for backgrounds all the time 
and uh that's really fun that is fun and you know i try to mix it up and keep people entertained i've actually covered suspiria the main theme on my shows uh i've done um you know to me the the greatest Oingo Boingo song is Ain't This the Life because it is straight up prog rock. I mean, it's more prog than, you know, what most people uh, get to put out and call prog rock nowadays. Um, you know, I've covered XTC songs, a lot of Beatles, yes, Genesis, you know, so it's it's uh, it's an odd bag that you get. At the think, you know, I think I think the best prog is the stuff that they're not trying to you know well, you have especially to be inspired you know you have to have some just genuine inspiration and you yeah. know all the people that we think are the rock gods had it in spades you know john anderson chris squire were full of inspiration for you know a good 10 or 15 years and uh you know especially the early stuff for me i just you know close to the edge relayer fragile you're just never going to touch a bunch of people that came together and got more creative and, and spoke from the heart. That they, they, exactly. they, they, they wrote the blueprint. There was no blueprint. They created it. And, you know, now everybody's just trying to copy that, you know, in a way. And no one ever will be able to because they were doing it out of passion, you know. And it's, it's yeah, they, that's what they, people need to remember is, you know, we're talking about what, you know, math rock and math prog and this you know everybody you know the the naysayers of prog look at us and they think it there's no emotion and there's no feeling and it's just technique and that's just bullshit i mean you know it might have become that in a lot of ways but when you look you yeah know, i think it does it, yeah. i think it did become more that but at yeah. the earlier but stages look at peter gabriel in 1973 or 72 that was all heart you know he was mm -hmm. the greatest vocalizing that almost anybody's ever done. For me, it was, you know, Bowie, Peter Hamill, and Peter Gabriel. You know, it's like almost no one was ever that creative or that passionate about music. And yeah. uh, they did a great job. And, uh, you know, so it's like, you know, if, if you learn one thing, it's like go direct to the blueprint of, of this genre. And, and create from your own. Don't don't copy the bands that you love. Mm -hmm. Get the inspiration from them, and do your own thing. Right. You know, I mean, you know, I know some diehard people. You know, fans will go, "Well, if you don't sound like, you know, these bands, we're not going to pay attention to you." And it's like, well, you know, then you're missing out. Mm -hmm. You know, because there's so much out there, so much original music that's trying to come out in between all these, you know, I want to say tribute or, you know, if you want to get nasty, clone bands, you know, and I, I blame the 90s. The 90s was the biggest clone era, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, there was actual labels that were created. And they were looking specifically for those bands and they were doing the same thing that mainstream music was doing. We're searching for, you know, all these, the same kind of styles. You know, we're not looking for anybody original anymore. We just want the same what was making money. But it's like, but when you pick that person, we're taking a chance on it. Yeah. They were original at, at one point. They were, you know, they were hungry for it. And you gotta look for those hungry artists that, you know, that are gonna bring something to the table. Yeah. Something new, something fresh, you know, that, you know, it's like you need, you know, I'll give an example. You need 10 Guns N' Roses. You really need that? You don't need one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Think uh yeah but, well, but I point that out to all the artists watching this if you're an artist burn as bright as you can get in touch with what you really want to do and what you really want to communicate and if you're not burning as bright as you can don't do it just don't do it and wait until you need to communicate something 
you know that's yeah. that's the thing don't just you know we all have fingers that hit an instrument and we can go play a thing don't do oh, that yeah. don't play unless you absolutely have to you know and think about what you can communicate with an audience and chase that and um you know that's it's it's thoughts like that that keep me going and always trying to figure out you know what i can give to people you know that's that's perfect that's a perfect you know um instruction perfect inspiration you know it's like don't you know i'll i'll take it you know it's like a lot of these people are like on cruise control or writing the coattails of others, you know, the other success. And it's like, okay, well, I'll, I'll sound like, you know, we'll go back to, I'm going to sound like Chris Squire. My thing is why? Why don't you yeah. sound like you? Yeah. You know, you'll hear, you know, it's like, it's going to be obvious. You'll hear moments in people's music that, you know, oh, that reminds me of, but oh, yeah. that, but it's just touching upon it, whereas there's these blatant, you know, they got to sound exactly like Chris White, or they got to sound, you know, like Bruford, or they got to sound like uh, Steve Howe, or, or Steve Hackett, you know. Don't. They didn't set out to say we're going to sound like, you know, what our inspirations. We took our inspirations as a blueprint, and, you know, here I go, you know, we're going in circles about this. But the blueprint, you know, we just got to go from the blueprint, what they took, and create your own music, you know. Yeah. I mean, we need more variety of sounds out there. We don't need the same stuff over and over and over again. We need more, you know. You know, I mean, some bank, some that, you know, you mentioned that I don't think I've heard anybody actually copy their sound as a uh, mandograph generator well they're, they're too intense nobody yeah. could do it yeah it's like, my goodness that it, i heard that that stuff and i'm like oh it's like i felt like okay i need to sit down you know it's like i'm already sitting down i need to sit down because this stuff is so out there i mean it's so i mean in a way, it's like beyond its years. You know, yeah. it, it had it had a punk, it had a punk and metal attitude long before that was a thing. Yeah, they were doing it in the early seventies. It's like it's so amazing that the stuff that was done in the seventies was a precursor to the eighties. Oh yeah, you know, but the eighties took it. You know, so it's like. Like it, like it, like he said, like uh, Mr. Martin said, go with your the passion in your heart for your music, and you will create possibly the most beautiful works of art you can. Uh, yeah, that your talent that your talent allows you for, and don't try to sound like your heroes. You know. Put them aside and just sound like yourself and you'd be amazed there's a killer video out uh you know there was a little i think only one show that peter hamill joined peter gabriel's band uh it was like for a special benefit and uh stuart copeland's the drummer uh it's a crazy band it's stuart peter peter and peter <laughs> and 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 peter gabriel gives Peter Hamill, um, uh, the spotlight at one moment and lets Peter sing lead on a song. And it's beautiful and fascinating. It's like from the eighties at some point, it was just like a one-off gig, like some fundraiser thing that they did. And I, I want to say there's some other killer people involved, but the only people that I remember are the, the Hamill and the Gabriel and, and Stuart Copeland on the gig, but there's, I think everybody on it is like crazy heavy. Um, really good. And then my last Vandergraaf touchstone is I'm so disappointed because they're headlining a festival in London uh, in September. And, um, you know, like, I don't have any money. And 
you know, in the dead world, there's so much stuff happening. You know, the Dead and Co. They do a big thing in Mexico in January called Playing in the Sand, and those tickets went on sale. And you have to get a package with the hotel and with travel. It's you know three or four thousand dollars. So it's like I'm like, okay, I can't do that. Uh, the you know, and when Red Rocks tickets went on sale and like you know a bunch of the jam band heroes were playing there, I couldn't afford to go. So I heard about this festival and I was like, man, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this and get, I'm, I'm going to treat myself nice and go to London, which I've been dying to go to again. And um, I'm going to see Vandergraaf, you know, because they've only been out. I think they've only played in Los Angeles once. And that was in 1976. And then they've, they've never been west of Wisconsin since that one time. And um, so, you know, they've come back on their couple reunions to uh, the East Coast, uh, but they've never come, you know, past uh, middle America. So I was going to go do that. And the festival tickets actually weren't that bad. But now in the post pandemic, the airfare, the ticket to London is seventeen hundred dollars. And that's yeah. that was the lowest I could find. I mean, you know, with the shittiest ticket. I mean, you know, it's really more like you know, $3,500 just to get there. Uh, so, you know, needless to say, I will not be making that trip. But uh, it would be a great fantasy of mine to see Peter Hamill before, you know, while both he and I are here on this planet, you know. Right. Incredible. Well, hopefully maybe they'll record it, you know, next yeah. next best thing, you know. That's that's how I look at, you know, when, when bands record their either a live CD or a live DVD or live now Blu-ray, you know, whatever the format. I think it's kind of cool because if you, like for instance, like you were saying, you can't afford to get to it, but you really wanted to see it, it is the, almost the next best thing because, I mean, granted, you're not going to get the energy off the band. Well, you will yeah. probably get the energy off the band, especially if you have a good, uh, set up for your you know watching your oh, yeah. videos yeah um but i know but it's the show the magic of the show i like oh that. yeah that's 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 the thing you know it's like i, I think be that's there and take a selfie of me in front of peter hamill <laughs> i gotta get my my friend i gotta i got a motor um right? yeah but thank you so much for having me on oh it's great to connect with you and Oh uh, yeah, it was so fun and and um, you know I really appreciate the good vibes and the energy and uh, oh yeah, you know, you know the word about Astral Arc out there and you know it's just oh really yeah. So, well, oh, I will say this: if anybody tunes in, um, and maybe if you can mention this in your promo too, our two songs are on Bandcamp, so it's astralarc.bandcamp.com, and on Friday, this coming Friday, August sixth. Uh, Bandcamp is giving all of the proceeds to the artist. So yes. if anybody wants, anybody can go and listen to our two songs for free. But if you could buy them, if you would like to buy them on Friday, August 6th, coming up uh, from midnight to midnight, PST, Pacific Coast time, um, you know, so uh, 9, 9 p.m. to 9 p.m. if you're on the East Coast. Um, if you can, if you can buy them on Friday, that would be really amazing and very helpful. Uh, oh yeah, you know, us now, you know, every time I hear about that, I hear about it the day late. Now I'm glad you know you're telling me yeah. it now, and I have another friend that talks about it. Um, so, and I think that's fantastic. Where you guys get 100% of the proceeds, you know, yeah, they're really great about it. You know, one thing, you know, it's like what people say, think, oh, what, we're going to get a discount? No. The band is going to get more, more money. Yeah. And you know I, what, I'm and you know what that, a dollar that, a song anyway, so it only costs you $2. Also, but the discount, they, they do take out a bunch of money, so it sucks. Yeah. And um, and the thing is, this is, no, the discount here is, and gets the full amount so they can make more music for you to enjoy exactly there's yeah. your discount that's a discount because you get more money you get yeah. more music down the line yeah you know and 
that, I think that's a fantastic thing, you know. So I'll put all those links uh, when I hook this up onto uh, YouTube. Killer. Put all those links down there for people to look at and and support you, you know, that way, you know. Don't just buy the songs once, maybe buy it, you know, tell your well, friends. And you can also pay more than the amount, you know, that's. Yeah, a, that's the one thing I noticed with the bank camp. They said that's, you know, get the minimum amount, but, it, you know, you know, give a little People more. So, 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 Mr. Mr. So Joel can make some more, more wonderful music for everybody yeah. out there. Joel eating. You know. It's my sole form of income. So, you know, it's very helpful. So, yeah. all, all right, right well, buddy. Well, thank you, thank you again um, for for coming on. You know, I really do appreciate it. You know, enjoy talking with you on here and off. Yeah, you know, got a lot of wonderful uh, chats over the over the past almost year. Totally. Uh, well, I'll let you know how the Crimson Show what is. It's all crazy. right. Yeah. So, well, enjoy enjoy the show and uh, and thanks thanks again for taking the time to talk with me. Today. Oh, it's such a pleasure, and I'm already looking forward to the next one. So, uh, all right, keep the series so, going. You're doing a great job. I can't believe you've had. I can't believe I'm 34. Yeah, your number you know, 34. One and one and 34. So. One and 34. That's pretty rad. Yeah. So, I look forward to talking to you again, and you know, take care and. Have, have fun at the Crimson Show and yeah. be safe out there. Frog power. Okay, see you, buddy. All right, see you later. <laughs>